Hello everyone, good morning. My name is Paula Benagini, one of the organizers of this event. First, I'd like to welcome you all to our workshop. I really appreciate your attendance today. Thank you all for coming. At Institute of Computing, we have many researchers on artificial intelligence. Uh, being two of them, Professor Marisa and, and I, uh, and she's co-organizing the event with me. Thank you so much. We as researchers in our graduate program in computing have looked at in some research to, impact, to the impacts of computational systems in many social scenarios. However, only recently, we have also paid more attention to ethics in artificial intelligence, especially after Professor Marisa joined us into our team of professors. Marisa and I started discussing ethics in trustworthy AI in 2019, before the pandemic time, and we have been gradually attracting more and more researchers and new students as well as achieving some potential results, although there is yet a long way to go further. From my perspective, the Brazilian society needs to define which ethical aspects on using artificial intelligence are important to us, as well as maybe define a ranking of their importance. Thereafter, there is a need to evolve methodologies on the development of, of computational systems considering how to implement the ethical aspects on AI as software and hardware requirements of these systems. This workshop is one important step to discuss and diverge in these aspects. I'm especially thankful to Professor Frederick for coming to visit us during these two days. I know he's very busy, it was quite difficult to arrange our agendas, but I'm really glad he's here with us to discuss this so important theme nowadays. I also would like to thank all the support from the Institute of Computing and our graduate program of computing for holding this workshop. More specifically, thank you, Professor José Rafael Bocchetti, uh, director of our institute, and Professor Alexandre Plastino, coordinator of our graduate program, for their personal and administrative support. Finally, I would like to thank to all the professors and students of our institute who directly or indirectly motivated and helped us on organizing this workshop. My special thanks also goes to Professor, Professor Daniel Oliveira, who helped us on the technical aspects to transmit this event, and Monica da Silva, our PhD student who volunteered to help us manage this transmission. I'd like to call Marisa for some brief words. Thank you so much, Marisa, for organizing this workshop with me. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I have no beautiful words like uh, my colleague uh, Flavia, but uh, I would like uh, to welcome all of you, my students that uh, are here. And, uh, I would like to thank the, our institute and uh, my, a friend, uh, and really uh, a good friend of mine, Fla Professor Flavia, to co-organize uh, these and uh, always uh, be uh, with me in these ideas of ethical AI. Thank you, Professor Fred, to be here. Thank you for my colleagues of uh, uh, Ethical Trust Earth AI Group that uh, is with me today. And um, uh, today is like a, a, a birthday of the, the first commemoration of the birthday birthday of an ethical and personal worth AI group that was uh, founded in September 2020 uh, with Professor Flavia, uh, with uh, uh, her support that uh, believed in my idea to create uh, a group about ethical AI in Brazil uh, today, uh, we have this group uh, with the 
going to the third year of working, as she said, a long way to produce uh, results in Brazil, but uh, I think uh, we have important steps now, and uh, I will present some of them in sequence. Thank you very much for all of you. Thank you, Flavia, and uh, all the supporters of this event. Thank you, Marisa. Well, uh, what, what, what started to be only a meeting, it turned into a workshop, and so we are going to have a presentation for us, to Marisa and Gilberto. We are going to take a, a break, uh, approximately uh, 10 and a quarter, 10 and 15, and after we have the presentation, uh, uh, the Frederick's presentation, okay? Uh, Monica, could you please present? Uh, yes. Thank you. Okay. I think that I can't. Okay. Uh, the first, the first slide, please. Yes. I'm going to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and digital government. Uh, I'm professor here at the Institute of Computing. I also coordinate the Group Center of Data Analysis for Citizenship. Uh, with Vitebo. Vitebo is traveling, so he couldn't be here today, but he's also a very good friend and a supporter of all our ideas. And I also participate from uh, uh, at the Center for Applied Research in Artificial Intelligence Recreating Environments, uh, which is coordinated by Professor Andrea Carvalho, who presented me to Frederick, and I'm very uh, glad and and grateful for the, thankful for this. Uh, please go, go on. Uh, I'm bachelor and I have master in PhD in computer science, mostly in machine learning since uh, 2000. I'm associate professor here at UFF uh, or Fluminense Federal University or UF, I don't know, uh, since 2009. I also, uh, I'm also part of the graduate program in computer science. I have uh, some master and PhD students here. Uh, I, I already told about the, the G4 seats and ship group. Uh, and I also coordinate the Brazilian Computing Society Interest Group in Digital Government. Uh, actually, my work uh, thinking about AI to, and, and society started when I uh, started working with digital government. And I have experience in projects in artificial intelligence, smart cities, and open data and open government. Uh, just because Frederick is here, I thought that it could be interesting to think about what is government in Brazil. Brazil is a presidential federative republic formed by the Union, the states, the federal district, and the municipalities uh, in the states, sorry. Uh, so the federal government is divided into three independent powers, the legislative, executive, and judiciary. Actually, uh, it, is a, uh, it resembles us to what the United Nations uh, says about democracy. And in Brazil, we have a particular issue that is, we have more than 5,000 municipalities. So, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the framework, the legal framework uh, that these municipalities have to attend. And so, there is a lot of work to do here in our uh, context. We can go. Uh, 
Uh, and what is electronic government or digital government? According to the United Nations, the government is the use of uh, information and communication technologies to more effectively and efficiently deliver government services to citizens and business. ICT is applied in government operations achieving public ends by digital means. The underlying principle of e-government is improve the internal working, workings of the public sector by reducing financial costs and transaction factors, better integrate workflows and processes, and enable effective resource utilization across the various public sector agencies aiming for sustainable solutions. Um, There, there, there are basically three types of government or uh, electronic government. Uh, one is the GovToGov, -gov, when data is shared between governmental actors. In case of Brazil, we can think about the organizations that change, uh, exchange data between the, the, the national organizations. Uh, but interages uh, of the, the, the diverse levels of government in Brazil. Government to business is when we think about business specific transactions, for example, when we have uh, bids and contracts with uh, the, the government with the companies, and government government to consumer or citizen, where the interaction between government and consumers of public services or citizens occurs, and so here we must think about the interactions to delivery public services and participation consultation and decision making process. So we can see that when it, we think about digital government, we have many scenarios uh, and many multi actors uh, situations. Okay? Uh, there were some phases of electronic government. Uh, in the late 90s, we started with only online services, government websites, and uh, information technology uh, systems. After, uh, after we have the open government initiatives and some the platforms and we started having the open data movement and open government and so on. Uh, in the third uh, phases, we have the ICT enabled innovations and what is what we call smart government. Uh, in this way, it appears open big data technologies uh, business process management, and from, uh, Internet of Things, blockchain, and so on. So very uh, uh, so many technologies in this area. Uh, services should be easily accessible, and in this way, artificial intelligence and analytics are uh, maybe used to support decision making, solve societal problems, optimize resources both six and well-being participation and so on. So with the last uh, phases, one more, Monica, please. Yes, thank you. We have the citizen-driven government. This is yet yeah, a state of the, of the art, but this is uh, our, uh, it's the nirvana that we would like to have in the government when the citizen drives what uh, they really want, and government adapts itself to the needs and expectations of cities, businesses, non-profit organizations, and others. We have in this way personalized interactive and easy to access interactions, and the United Nations sees digital government as a tool for building effective, inclusive, and accountable institutions to support policy making and service delivery for the uh, sustainable uh, development goals. So, uh, and what do you think, do we think about the digital government as a research area? So in 1987, the IFP Working Group 
started discussing information systems in public administrations. So the main conference of uh, this group is the IFP of uh, which merges in the trunk government and the trunk participation in open government conferences uh, with a focus on open government, smart government, gold tech, participation and democracy. And some related topics are social media, digital transformation, digital society, artificial intelligence, policy information, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, we have the Digital Government Society, which arised, uh, was born in the United States. It, were, it was formed in 2006. Uh, Al Gore was one of the formers of this society, or one of the, the people that was more interested in this area in the United States. And the mission is DGS develops and supports interdisciplinary research about digital government amongst the international research community by advancing and disseminating academic and practice based relevant knowledge and built international networks. Okay, so uh, just, uh, just to finish, uh, the main conference is the Digital Government, DGO, and in 2025 it will be held in Brazil, in Porto Alegre, so I hope that all of you could send papers to DGO and we can find <laughs> each other in Porto Alegre, okay? And so, I, I brought some numbers to think about uh, how many papers in these conferences are bringing artificial intelligence in their papers? So I discovered that in EGO from 2002 to 2022, it's when uh, it started to be published by Springer at Lecture Notes, Notes in Computer Science, and it has uh, I found 128 papers in DGO 145 and I saw 110. Uh, we can go. But what is interesting to observe is that when we start in 2000, when we see uh, from 2017 up to now, we have a very uh, a great raise in the number of papers published in these conferences in, uh, discussing artificial intelligence in the context of uh, digital government. So I I I look at a little bit more, and I found that in 2018. DGO had a panel on towards and ethics of digital government. A first discussion, so they were starting to think about this aspect in digital government. In 2021, uh, they, uh, they organized the National Strategies and Policies of Artificial Intelligence. Uh, actually, it was uh, uh, some people from Spain, so that's why they called IA, as we say here in Portuguese. And they discussed models, priorities, and governance as they observed that countries like China, France, Germany, Spain launched strategies for the next five or ten years to promote the development of AI in their countries, infrastructure. And they also uh, started looking to human resources, regulations, and ethics. So researchers debated these different strategies. And we will have in Nico this year. Uh, me and Frederick and Zappa and Ro, we are going to discuss trustworthy AI governance in Nico. We also will have a panel discussion there. So I I go, I went further to discover uh, if there were some papers discussing this, uh, discussing ethics in AI and digital government, and uh, I found a little, uh, some interesting works, Monica. Uh, 
One of the papers that is quite interesting, and Professor Marai Nansen, that is Professor from uh, TU Delft, uh, he also wrote a paper in this area that is, we only, uh, in order to have ethics, uh, we need to think about data management. So, analytics in public sector renew and attention to which open data, IoT, and big data. So, this is a, a uh, uh, a reality nowadays. So we have artificial intelligence, statistical modeling, and computer simulation in this area. So we need data analysis here, or we use data analysis techniques. We pay much attention to the development of data analysis process, but we pay less attention to data management considering AI in government. So data management are even more important in the AI context, uh, just because you need to think about many values that must be uh, attended. I'm going to talk a little bit, this, a little bit more about this for you uh, in what follows. Achieving the potential of AI for social good relies on investment of social outcome, investments on building trust in government data and ensuring that they are ready and suitable for use. These are very challenging, challenging tasks in government. Uh, in this work, they pointed out what are the potential harms caused by AI systems in the scenario of digital government. So bias and discrimination, denial of individual autonomy, recourse and rights, non-transparent and explainable or unjustifiable uh, outcomes, evasion of privacy, isolation, disintegration of social connection, unreliable, safe or poor quality outcomes. All of the authors, all of the works that I have read about it, uh, say a lot that ethics in artificial intelligence in the scenario of digital government is yet more uh, serious as we have too many people that are uh, that use the, the services from the government so this is uh, particularly very important and they analyzed the ai ethics principles in 15 countries and they discovered that accountability, uh, 14 countries uh, pointed out accountability uh, as an important factor in their AI ethics principles, in their regulation and so on. Fairness in 13, transparency in 12, privacy in 11, safety and security 10, diversity 9, Human centricity and rights nine, public benefits eight, reliability six, auditability five, and contestability three. So we can see that uh, depending on the culture of the, the country, uh, you may have different factors that are more or less important for that country. Okay. Uh, the other one is, was this work. And I, 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 just, I, I think that this work is quite interesting because they presented the challenges on implementing AI in the public se sector. They analyzed the eight, uh, eight in depth case studies of AI solutions and they used a reference to, to think about what are the classes of challenges. And this one they added after they started their uh, in-depth case studies. But they, they, they pointed out that the five classes of challenges is AI society, AI ethics, AI law and regulations, AI technology implementation, and then AI organizational change. So we see that the technology, which is the part that we from computer science uh, most we see are yeah, it's just one class of challenges. Um, they also pointed out and presented a, a very interesting and important discussion that piloting AI solution or when you are 
testing the, your ideas and testing the algorithms and so on. Uh, you need proper, large, and no biased database, testing process for ensuring trustworthiness, proper process to ensure explainability. But this is on, only in the part of when you are developing the solution. When you are going to deploy this AI system, this system is going to be in practice. You need to have a heavy maintenance for improving the models if they deprecate and so on. Uh, and it's very important that the public servants and all the people that make decisions be aware that AI can fail. Uh, AI in this, in this way, uh, we need to think that it differs from the standard technologies as it does not follow simple with the logic, as it can be considered as a new class of agents in the organizations that needs to be trained, but also that can make mistakes, okay? It's not uh, computer systems that they are always correct. Uh, I'm going to show just a little bit of our main research agenda that I coordinate. I mainly work with ecosystems of open government data to smarter cities. Uh, this is a quite interesting work because uh, there are some people that ask me, is a city smart or not? I think that we need to pick processes and projects to turn the cities smarter. But this is a discussion to another seminar, okay? Uh, no. Uh, in 2016, uh, I published it uh, with many colleagues on challenges in Brazilian smart cities when thinking about information systems. And there, there are two main parts that uh, I've been working a lot. Uh, one is platforms for open data management, uh, allowing data integration, data visualization, recommender systems for recovering appropriate data, tools for data support, uh, decision support, uh, or database decision support systems. Uh, and data science is still an art. So uh, when we think about the machine learning process or artificial intelligence process of generating models, uh, is an art because it's not fully automatic, uh, automated, okay? There are many initiatives to, to turn uh, machine learning algorithms more easy to, to uh, train and so on. But it's still a state of the art, so we are we have a lot to do in this area, and particularly depending on the scenario, uh, the steps on training the models can be uh, quite more difficult or very specific to the, to that scenario. Uh, I really like this picture very much. Because when we think about the government perspective, the government think first on policies, after the processes to implement the policies, and only then they think about services. But we, citizens, we see the services first. Only a few can see the processes behind, and if fewer people see the policies behind that. So, I think that uh, shortening these, uh, these uh, parts uh, could be interesting, but I think it's still a challenge for research community. Uh, so my main research agenda, uh, considering the scenario of cities, we have internal government computing systems, uh, they may feed open government data portals, and for, for our, from our perspective, uh, in Brazil we have uh, transparency portals to attend the transparency law, we have the open data portals to attend the law, uh, access to information law, and so on. Uh, so there are many open 
government data portals in cities, but also in state and, and federal government. Um, and we see that any uh, go uh, government portal that offers data to the, the citizens, it could be or should be uh, an open government data portal. Uh, we have a, a project that we are conducting here in the city of Niterói, and we are seeing that including the the official gazette of the the, the city uh, here we call Diário Oficial, okay, and it only has the PDF, and it's very difficult to read, and it's very difficult to consume the information. So it also should be considered consider it as an open government data board, okay? So there are many internal government computing systems that feed these uh, portals. We also may have services via applications uh, such as Colab and many others using artificial intelligence technologies. So uh, we have many actors here which could be citizens, local governors, entrepreneurs, and they may consume data information and services. They also may generate data or opinions, and these, these data could be used by machine learning and opinion mining uh, uh, algorithms, and AI, so AI technologies are here. Databases from the internal government computing systems may also be used. So we need to think about the ethical and legal aspects in this, in this way. Uh, so my main work, uh, my main research agenda is how to manage these assets and aspects, data, information, and AI-based models. So we need to think about also how to to manage these models. That's it. Thank you so much for your attention. And this is my contact, my LinkedIn. And I know if anyone, uh, everyone is uh, aware about the ID, here is my ORCID profile too. Thank you so much. I'd like to, to call Lisa for her talk. Uh, we will open for discussion in the end of the, the section of this, this morning in, a, in one block for discussion, okay? Uh, well, uh, I will talk a little about the ethical and uh, regulation of Latin America and the Caribbean countries. Uh, I will present a part of the ethical work we are doing. And uh, my colleague Gilberto will present uh, the aspects of the regulation in Latin America and Caribbean countries in sequence. Uh, my, my main research area here in the Computing Institute is the ethical and sustainable artificial intelligence. My main objective uh, is to promote the development the use of sustainable and ethical AI seeking to ensure that humanity benefits from the technology and that these benefits are widely shared. This is my main research agent. And uh, so uh, this, um, uh, so I'm focused on the sustainability uh, and looking for the sustainable, uh, the SDG uh, and the um, SDG 13 aims to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change and take actions to combat its impact. And uh, in this uh, way, I have been working in green artificial intelligence since 2019, more or less. And uh, the idea of green and sustainable AI and machine learning is to reduce the impact 
to, to overcome uh, to not impact again in the climate change. And also uh, in the project, the, the EU Nowcast project, uh, we have students that will present some ongoing work in the, the second part of this day. Uh, is the idea to use machine learning for extreme uh, to the prediction of extreme air, uh, weather conditions uh, in urban areas. And uh, my uh, work, because this Hill Nowcast project is uh, a big project uh, with uh, other uh, institutions here, uh, the National Laboratory of Scientific Computing, CEFET, and also uh, Institute of Computing that uh, has a grant now of uh, Serra Pilheira Institute. And my main uh, research focus here is these models focused on green, uh, green approaches too. And uh, the second part of my work is about ethics and uh, is the actions to, for the promotion of an ethical and responsible AI in Brazil and Latin America. And uh, in, uh, I will uh, focus today in this presentation in this uh, part of my work, despite the fact that uh, in the second part we have uh, uh, a student, uh, a, student uh, uh, a master degree student that I co advisor with Professor Flavia that will present here now. Cast. Next. Well, uh, the ethical and trust of uh, worth AI group in Brazil, the name of Portuguese intelligence uh, group, uh, nosso grupo é Núcleo de Referência Inteligência Artificial Ética e Confiável, in Portuguese. And uh, this group uh, was founded in 2020 uh, with my colleague, Professor Flavia Bernardini, that is organizing this event. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, we didn't have in Brazil national uh, strategy for AI and uh, any discussion about regulation. So in 2019, Flavia and I uh, discussed about this topic and uh, since 2015, I have been uh, following the, the workers about ethics in the uh, European Union. And uh, I went to, uh, twice to Brussels to follow the high level expert group uh, workers. And uh, uh, on that time, I was very worried about uh, the discussion in Brazil was very, uh, very shy. And uh, uh, we talked a lot, uh, Flavia and I, uh, we need to uh, put this talk on the main words. And um, so we founded this uh, group. Uh, the Ethical and Trust Worth AI group is a multidisciplinary group of specialists from different areas uh, of knowledge. We have psychologists, philosophers, computer scientists, lawyers, and uh, uh, which includes multiple teaching, research, and uh, industry institutions. Uh, our mission is to develop and to disseminate the recommendations that serve as basis for public policies related to AI uh, and development uh, and use of ethical, legal, and robust, responsible AI systems. Uh, they, uh, we have different working groups uh, in this uh, ethical first world for AI nucleus or group. And uh, for example, we have uh, members interested in AI and uh, intellectual property, personal data protection, psychological impacts, and, and uh, so on. And uh, uh, since 2020, we have many discussions, and uh, we consider uh, we are a beginning a beginner. We are beginners uh, uh, in this topic. In this meantime, we have uh, we had the national 
strategy. Uh, I will not comment about this and my opinion, but and also proposals uh, of regulations. Uh, we we have been uh, some work disseminating contents about uh, uh, the what is AI, what's not AI. Uh, how to deal about this talk of ethical AI in Brazil, uh, about uh, uh, data protection, interaction, how to understand this connection uh, uh, between these uh, two topics, these issues. And uh, uh, this year of 2023, and see, uh, our main action and uh, my main focus uh, specifically is in the initiatives of AI literacy. Uh, and why uh, uh, we, we founded this group? Of course, today uh, it's evident the importance of this kind of uh, groups to Brazil and uh, that time for Rio de Janeiro. But uh, also, uh, this paper uh, said a lot. Uh, this paper from September 2020, just when we founded the Ethical Infrastructure AI Group, that said AI ethics groups are repeating one of the society's classic mistakes, uh, uh, saying about uh, the global uh, ethical AI groups uh, had no uh, Brazilian or no Latin American countries and Caribbean uh, countries uh, uh, inside these initiatives, sharing uh, knowledge, uh, the own perspective of, of Latin America, uh, preserving our multilingualism. For example, in Latin America, we have 8% of the population uh, indigenous with uh, their main language, for example, just one point. So uh, now in 2023, uh, we have, for example, this uh, global AI ethics consortium has one Brazilian institution, one uh, from Chile, and one from Ar uh, Argentina, okay? Uh, and uh, so this was the motivation to found the group on that time. And uh, uh, saying uh, more specifically about the AI literacy, that is my uh, main uh, work in this moment in, the, in this uh, ethical uh, initiative. Uh, we are working in AI and ethical literacy, uh, what we can say that is education for AI. When we see the discussions about uh, the interaction uh, uh, with uh, the education and AI, we have uh, two sides, the uh, AI for education, supporting professors, students, and but in the other side, education for AI, this, that's the point. Uh, and I have here uh, a mention about the uh, uh, National Educational Scientific and Cultural Organization publish, uh, publication that say the world's citizens need to understand what the impact of AI might be what AI can do and what it cannot do when AI is useful and when its uh, use should be questioned and how AI might be steered for the public good. Uh, in, uh, in summary, uh, we talk a, a lot, for example, the impacts of AI in the future of work. Okay, the future of work is, uh, is in danger. And what we are doing to overcome this? We need to begin. So we need education for AI. We need to prepare citizens. Uh, and uh, so uh, we have uh, two uh, points. Uh, one, 
learning about AI, preparing citizens to live in the uh, AI area. In this point, um, I focus on, the, on professors and the students of high school. And the second one, uh, especially the importance uh, of uh, ethics and uh, education for students of computing uh, undergraduate courses. Because they will be the future technology developers. They will be the moral agents of AI in the future. So uh, I'm advocating the importance to have uh, initiatives of ethical teaching inside these uh, uh, computing courses. And uh, Monica will present some uh, ongoing works uh, beginning uh, up getting uh, results and uh, first results we have in this in this in this uh, idea. So uh, about the learning about AI for professors and students in high school, uh, we have uh, uh, discussions with uh, multi U that is uh, a company of the Rio de Janeiro municipality that produce. Um, uh, Technology produce content uh, to, uh, for students of the public schools uh, in, the city, in the city of Rio de Janeiro. And uh, the, uh, in our first uh, uh, meeting, uh, they uh, presented me this uh, online uh, course, Elements of AI. I think Professor Frederick uh, know this <laughs> online platform. Uh, and uh, we are planning to produce some similar content for, uh, to professors here in Brazil to spread this content uh, online. And the uh, second for students, uh, we are preparing a project here in the Computing Institute. The name will be Programming and Artificial Intelligence for Digital, um, uh, I don't know how to say, uh, citizenship uh, and uh, to uh, bring the students uh, to the Computing Institute to teach uh, uh, program, pro uh, 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 computational thinking, the second model, artificial intelligence, and the third one, data protection and uh, ethics. So it's uh, that's uh, uh, a beautiful. You'll be a beautiful project. <laughs> I love that. So, uh, and the second initiative uh, is the Ethicalia, is a consortium of ethics for public policies on artificial intelligence for Latin America and the Caribbean. I'm the head uh, of uh, this consortium. Uh, I, um, uh, um, uh, Gilberto is also uh, a member and I have uh, other uh, professors of the institute uh, too. And uh, Professor uh, Tayani Oliveira, also from the Federal Fluminense University, and uh, Diego Chavarro uh, from Colombia. The consortium uh, uh, has the main question uh, that guide us, that is, what can be done to increase the capacity of Latin American countries for this ethical high-tech uh, AI policies and the research? And uh, it was on April 28th, so we are beginning the, the works. And uh, the consortium will develop research and recommendation on the following topics. Regulation and public policies for implementing AI, race, ethic, gender, territoriality, and the linguistic biases uh, in our countries, citizens and environment uh, rights. Uh, and uh, I will not list all of them, but one of them also is education, literacy, and research in artificial intelligence for sustainable development. So this, uh, five main research topics must be concrete actions for Latin America and Caribbean and not only discussions, okay? Uh, next, and uh, this map uh, was, for example, motivation to, uh, to this consortium. This is uh, a map 
as AI and machine learning see the world. Data is the main basis of machine learning, that is the main sub-area of artificial intelligence we see today uh, in our day life, in our apps. And uh, data, uh, we see this is uh, the data sets where artificial intelligence is being trained. And uh, we see we have only two countries, uh, two data sets from Latin America. So uh, we are biased again. And uh, it's uh, uh, that was uh, one of the motivations uh, for this group. And uh, we have a lot of work to do here beginning. And uh, uh, OK, next. Uh, OK, that's my part. Uh, I would like to invite my colleague, Prof uh, Professor Gilberto. And I would like to say, Gilberto, uh, share the is one of the heads of the Ethical and Trustworth AI group. Uh, Flavia uh, was the head with me uh, in the first year, and after that uh, I have been the support of this uh, very uh, important friend for me in this initiative, and uh, which understood a lot about regulation. Please, Gilberto. Good morning. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, Universidade de Del Fornis for such a kind uh, invitation. And I also wanted to congratulate Professors Marisa Ferro and Flavio Bernardini for the immaculate organization of this very timely and important uh, workshop. Uh, Marisa, thank you so much for your very kind introduction. And uh, I also wanted to reinforce that we are all very happy with the presence of uh, Professor Heinz. I'm very much looking forward to his uh, presentation. Uh, well, um, uh, I will, as Patrice anticipated, I will address the matter of uh, legal implications, regulations, and uh, my connection with this subject dates back to the first half of the 80s, when I started to have this academic interest, especially with regards to legal implications of AI and practical application of AI. For instance, the experiment in Mogi das Cruzes in São Paulo, which was at the time an international benchmark of application of AI in the judiciary. And uh, then I moved into IBM, where I had the chance to get some more in-depth uh, learning on AI, and I left in the second half of the 90s to teach uh, at the Catholic University, uh, to teach on internet and uh, IT, and inclusively in uh, uh, AI. And can you hear me? Oh, okay, thank you. And, uh, and then, uh, finally, I started assisting some multilateral organizations, especially the Council of Europe and the United Nations, where I have been a consultant and a researcher for different divisions of the UN. So that's my background. And uh, so I would like to then show a little bit of the roadmap of uh, AI regulation. Uh, this is a, a picture from uh, last month, July. And uh, it shows that uh, perhaps China is the most advanced in uh, AI regulation. Of course, we can think that such a picture is uh, not focusing on uh, some kind of uh, political uh, uh, considerations and uh, rather the technical uh, approach. And uh, we can also see that uh, in South America, we have uh, uh, countries 
where the regulation is not complete, but is on the way. So I guess good news is we don't have to face inertia. We are already at some speed, but we have a lot of room to grow, a lot of space of building uh, things. We can also see that in gray there, uh, Africa and also the Caribbean, and we are talking about uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, are in, presumably, they uh, cannot offer so far a lot of information. So they are in gray. Uh, this is very uh, suggestive, and I will come back later. Uh, about uh, government readiness, and Flavia was very keen showing the different aspects of digital government. And uh, when we look at the world map there, we can also see that some countries in darker blue are more advanced, and in Latin America, we are, I would say, in an intermediate stage of preparation. So again, we are ready at some speed, but there is still uh, a lot for building. Thank you. And uh, what's the relevance of uh, Latin America? At times, I used to see percentages showing that the relevance of Latin America was uh, 3% max, 5% of anything in the world of IT. But then, when we look at, uh, for instance, chat GPT usage, we see that we have two countries among the five top countries in terms of the rate of usage. So uh, the relevance of uh, this uh, region, geographical re region, has attracted a lot of attention. And uh, this may be one of the reasons of the recent visit of the Czech GPT guys to Rio. And uh, they said that uh, Rio de Janeiro was the highest uh, among the cities or states or geographical units uh, in terms of uh, uh, per capita uh, usage of ChatGPT. So Brazil and Colombia uh, among the, the group of companies which respond for, stand for 30%, almost one third of global usage of ChatGPT. So I think this uh, talks uh, by itself. Uh, regarding strategy, national strategies, we can see uh, in the region that we have uh, many countries with uh, some published, already published national uh, strategies, as in the case of Brazil uh, from uh, 2021. 20, and uh, it was a very, I guess, uh, interesting case, that of Brazil, uh, we had uh, public consultation, so there was a democrat democratic process to build this uh, uh, national strategy with more than 1,000 public uh, contributions from the public. So it's something that was built top-down and also bottom-up. Uh, it's a converging uh, movement, and again, the Caribbean is also gray in this uh, old map, again and again and again. We can move. And that was a study of the OECD. Uh, I showed before the UNESCO, and then I showed the OECD, which is an indication also of the interest of those uh, uh, international organizations in focusing on uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Well, when we see uh, how far the enablers have been in that region, we can see in the left side that when we talk about objectives, goals, and also of metrics, we are okay, we are reasonably okay. But when we focus on mechanisms, on operationality and monitoring, then we are still a lot behind. So I think that's very much consistent with what we see in the world map. 
we are at some speed, but we have a lot to build and grow. And uh, this is a little bit about the Caribbean. And uh, I would say the Caribbean is a very interesting case. I have witnessed uh, some attempts of the United Nations to build uh, regulations. And by the way, I'm a part of a group of experts uh, which are right now who are right now uh, building a possible international convention on AI. So I have witnessed some uh, attempts to build this from within, and uh, also uh, how these the difficulties of approving some top-down uh, as the UN needs consensus of all countries, and sometimes consensus is very difficult to obtain. So I remember. I was designated by the UN together with a German professor to run a project in the Eastern Caribbean. But why Eastern Caribbean? Those are small countries, island countries. The reason was very simple. They were brand new countries. They are independence, national independence, they were 50, 60, max 70 years. And uh, they had not an inheritance of a regulation that would compromise building something from the outset. And uh, so in the Caribbean, it was possible to build uh, a platform of six laws for the internet, uh, cybercrime, interception of communications, freedom of information, data privacy, electronic contracts, and electronic documents, evidence. That way, we can build a common glossary of technology. And uh, the, one of the problems that we have with AI, AI regulation is we have a data privacy law called here in Brazil LGPD uh, in the Europe and GDPR. And it has a glossary. Then we have a bill of law for AI, which has a different glossary. Then we move to ISO norms or to NIST or to CIS controls. There are different clusters. So one of the facets of all these is the need of building consistency throughout regions and uh, throughout uh, all those uh, pieces. We can move ahead with you. So now we'll focus specifically in Brazil, very quickly, about the executive branch, we have the national strategy. Uh, I have already mentioned the public consultation, the contributions. Then, in the legislative branch at the Congress, we have a main bill of law, which was approved very recently in May. Uh, at the Senate, it, has, it was sent to the Chamber of Deputies and is inspired by European guidelines. And uh, But then we have a little bit of nuance here. Europe has a very specific circumstance. Europe must take a minimum, minimum approach so that it can uh, attract most major number of countries. Uh, so it has to be very much principles based and not very uh, uh, deep in details. Here in Brazil, we should have the opposite direction. We don't have to have to attract the interest of uh, different uh, areas or countries. So for the Brazilian legislation, in, in theory, we should have a bill of law that would start some vertical uh, platform, not only principles, very vague uh, legislation. It's a different uh, scenario. And we also have uh, the laws, for instance, the LGBT, data privacy and regulation, for instance, the government that flag is so well uh, uh, addressed. That show I expect, I expect that to drive contents in the sequence. And Brazilian courts have already developed and used AI systems. So the very end of the line, the, the courts, if they are already using AI systems, for instance, in the Supreme Court, STF, it's a good sign. And uh, there have been already some decisions 
based on the use of AI, for instance, on geo pricing. And uh, we have uh, this main view of law. It's principles based and uh, it's national, so it should be applied uh, on the same way by federal, state, and municipalities. But the municipalities uh, are more than 5,000, as Flava has shown. So, how to uh, ensure consistency throughout that amount of uh, governmental units, more than 5,000? Uh, if you don't have the backbone, the legislation, with details, only principles. So you provoke a huge margin of subjectivity and flexibility, and then make it some kind of problem. Uh, it's uh, very much a risk management oriented, uh, risk assessment requirement, and uh, so some constraints are imposed regarding uh, excessive risk AI or high risk AI. So the provisions are very similar to the ones that we can find in the data privacy law, but we don't have an order of precedence. We shall be applied with a, a priority. Is the data privacy regulation or it is the AI regulation? The data privacy authority says it has the final word on data privacy. And it has already uh, commented on the bill, on the AI bill of law. So is the data privacy authority the one that will be also the authority for the AI? Should it be? But the agenda of AI is much broader than data privacy, right? And uh, the bill of law has not indicated who or what should be which should be the authority for AI. So that's very much subject to uh, political decisions afterwards. Uh, it also has not addressed the implication of international services and operations uh, differently from what we see in Europe. And this aspect of uh, AI services or operations coming from the inflow and outflow is regulated. So it's so much important it should be also uh, dealt with, not clear uh, uh, whether the uh, national strategy, which is prior to this bill of law, should be updated once this bill of law is approved at the Congress. So that was it. Thank you so very much for this opportunity. And uh, uh, well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that we have a little bit of late, but I think we, we are on, not so long time, but long time yet. So we have a coffee break for 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, and then 45, we come back to Frederick present his, his, uh, his talk. And after we have the discussions, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, and break just a little bit, and we'll be back.
Okay, uh, good. Well, <laughs> which time Sonia now? But anyway, uh, nice to be here. Uh, my name is Felix Heinz. I'm a professor of computer science at the Chopin University, uh, uh, where I've uh, been involved in AI activities for, for about a little bit more than 20 years now. Started as a PhD student in 2000. Uh, so, so um, what I wanted to talk about here today uh, is about uh, the European approach uh, to this human-centered, uh, trustworthy AI. Uh, so, so I have been involved as part of this uh, uh, high-level expert group uh, that the European Commission put together, I think it was in 2018, 16, I don't remember. Ah, 2018, I think we started, uh, uh, where we developed these ethical guidelines for trustworthy AI. And today I also lead uh, the European network called Taylor, where we are developing the scientific foundations for trustworthy AI. Uh, so, so I will talk a little bit about that, and also a little bit about kind of uh, uh, connections to, to other things. So, so, I mean, we've heard several very interesting presentations here before, uh, and, and I want to kind of touch upon or relate a little bit to, to them as well. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, a little bit about the background. So, actually, we've been doing quite a lot of work on autonomous systems. So, actually, we built fully autonomous uh, helicopters about 20 years ago. Uh, so, this uh, one in the middle here is a 100 kilo uh, helicopter uh, uh, that we made completely autonomous in around 2003, 2004. Uh, and actually, I think this has been very kind of influential for me personally because what we did was actually integrate a lot of AI technologies into working fielded systems, and then we use them to support uh, rescue workers, first responders, and so on, and to help them do the work. We also wanted to have benefit from that. Um, uh, today, oops, yeah, next please. <laughs> uh, today I lead uh, uh, the, the reasoning and learning lab. Uh, so we are about, well, we are kind of growing, so we're about 20 people right now. I actually have two more PhD students starting in a few next week. Or, after. Uh, so, so we're uh, quite a large group and we're growing. Uh, and I mean, our background, we were actually starting more in kind of traditional AI, knowledge representation, uh, logics, and so on, and using this, for example, for verification and validation of these autonomous systems. Then, of course, we are working also a lot on machine learning. Uh, and uh, of course, this intersection here, or the, the connection between them, is, is very interesting. And we've also been doing work with multi-agent uh, systems, uh, but but I would not talk too much about the kind of more technical work that we are doing, even though I will, will mention some of it. Um, so so if we now go into toy, I mean, of course, everyone I hear you know already that that AI is here now. Uh, I don't know what the situation is in Brazil, but I, I know at least in Sweden sometimes there's still people talking about AI as well. We'll see when it comes. Uh, more the kind of futuristic approach, or not futuristic approach, but more the uh, expecting it to happen rather than being something that's here. But then I tell them, well, you are using AI every day, and you're probably using it every day for like 10, 15 years, you're using it in recommendations for movies, for music, for books, you use it for uh, finding, I mean, searching, I mean, <laughs> maybe not 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, I mean, search was an AI problem. Today, it's something that everyone just takes for granted that it works. Uh, or you use speech recognition in your phones, and so on and so forth. I mean, we're using AI technology every day, uh, and it's really, really helpful. Uh, so, of course, AI is here now. Uh, but we also see that the development is very rapid, and I mean, there are so many things happening. Of course, uh, the last year, it's been a lot of focus on this with generative AI. Uh, and of course, with this uh, generating images, uh, the large language models, ChatGPT, and so on, uh, uh, I, I, I think that really the, the difference here is that it's kind of publicly facing. It's something that actually uh, every or most people. I mean, now I said with the, the most uh, active users uh, in Rio de Janeiro, so it's even more uh, activities here. But that, that it really is something that connects to everyday people not just people working in, in technology or people doing research and so on. So, so I really think that's different, but it's definitely that things are going really, really quickly. And uh, that AI will affect all aspects of society. And I, I think to, to me, it's very clear that AI is what's called general purpose technology. 
So it's not only that it's a technology in itself, but rather it's a technology which affects and influences and hopefully accelerates the development in all other areas. And, and I, I would argue that it also applies to science. So, so my expectations is that, I don't know, in 10 years, something like that, basically all the Nobel Prizes will be developed using AI technology in some part of the process. Uh, so we are, for example, working with material scientists and uh, how to speed up the discovery of new materials. And of course, we see a lot of interest in I mean, alpha fold and all the kind of medical applications. So uh, basically, you can see AI as a new uh, microscope or telescope. It allows to study new things that previously couldn't be studied. And you can also speed up the study in other areas. So I really think there's a lot of very interesting things there. But of course, since this also uh, affects society at large and, and broadly, uh, it's really important that this technology is trustworthy so that we can trust that this, this technology really is in our uh, benefit. Uh, and I also like this kind of human-centered term, meaning that the, the, the AI in itself is not, doesn't really have a value of its own, but rather the value is the value that it pro pro provides for us and, and that it really supports us as people. Uh, and then lastly, I mean, we haven't talked about this uh, AI and jobs. I have some 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 slides about that. Uh, but I really think that the key here is not that AI. I mean, I, I don't. I personally don't uh, put much uh, emphasis on this kind of more existential risks and these kind of things. And I I, I don't see them as particularly likely. Uh, but I do think there will be major consequences, mainly on the the, the fact where. Those people that effectively can use the technology will have a significant benefit over those people that do not uh, are not able to use the technology, and I really think that's the, the key here. Uh, so, so I don't believe that AI will outcompete people, but rather people that use AI effectively will outcompete those that don't. And, and actually, this might not be that much on the individual level, but more on the organizational level. So, for example, those companies or organizations. That can use the technology effectively without competing those that don't. And here, I think, will be their the, the really key challenge for me. Yeah, I, I mean, this is more to have a bit of historic perspective. I mean, I know 10 years ago, there was a lot of focus on autonomous driving. Um, uh, then there was all this focus on uh, uh, computers beating the humans, uh, the, yeah, the, the world champions in the different types of games like Go and chess and poker. And, Starcraft and Dota and so on and so forth. And today, of course, the focus is really on this generative uh, AI. Uh, and behind all of these different applications uh, is, of course, this very broad term of AI. And I mean, uh, um, you, can, you can discuss what does AI really mean, uh, but I think in, in essence, what we want to achieve is we want the computers to be able to do things that previously only people could do. So it's really about pushing the frontier, pushing the border, uh, what can be done by machines. Uh, and I, I think that's the kind of key key point. Next, please. Uh, and of course, we also related to this both the speed, but also the quality. Uh, what we see today is that uh, basically the, the computer generated systems are becoming better than we are at uh, many particular tasks. Uh, so uh, we can take something like handwritten recognition. I mean, it's been worked on for a long time. I mean, um, and early uh, neural networks in the mid 80s were being used for this, for example, speech recognition, image recognition, reading comprehension, language understanding. I'm not sure I would agree to understanding, but at least the uh, very uh, sophisticated, very capable language models uh, that can do things that, I mean, 10 years ago, we probably, if someone would have said 10 years ago, we would have a system that basically can answer any question reasonably well and can do all the things that uh, these large language models could do. I think very few would, would have believed that that would be possible uh, in such a short time. So, so I really think that the progress has been amazing uh, and we see that it's clearly uh, uh, reaching levels where, uh, where it's better than, than most people. Next, please. But at the same time, uh, I think it's also important to realize that uh, even though that these automated systems is, uh, uh, are very good, I actually think it's still the case that the combinations of AI and humans are better 
than either AI's humans on their own. Uh, and examples I've been using for, for quite some time, I think, probably using this slide for about 10 years, almost 10 years now. Uh, but anyway, that the, the fact that uh, we humans don't have a chance against machine in chess, we haven't had a chance since, what is, 1997, when Gary Kasparov lost against uh, IBM Deep Blue. Uh, but still, what if you see today, the interest in chess has never been higher. The quality of human chess playing has never been higher. Actually, some people claim that Magnus Carlsen, one of the best uh, chess players, he's the best human because he's the best uh, at emulate playing like a computer. So he's the one that has been the best at learning how to play like a computer, and therefore he's, he's the best because he's been playing against these computers uh, since he was a small child. Uh, so so it's, it's clearly just, just because um, uh, the machines are better than us, it doesn't make it uninteresting. It's like saying that, uh, why should we compete in like a 100-meter sprint uh, when we could just have a car or a motorcycle or something? We still find it interesting to see people running, even though, of course, we can drive much faster if we have a vehicle. Uh, so, so it's the same thing here. Uh, and, of course, there is also a lot of interest in humans playing against uh, chess uh, players. However, it's very uninteresting to have two computers playing against each other. But actually, I, I, that was kind of vindicated when I, I found out that my son was watching, they were putting ChatGPT against Stockfish. And of course, ChatGPT didn't follow the rules, it just changed the board and did moves that couldn't be done. But apparently that was fun to watch. Uh, but I think it was more the comical value than the kind of interest of the, the game itself. Uh, so, but so, so we can see that uh, the, it's clearly the case that the machines are better than we are. However, if you then uh, compare or combine, uh, have teams of both humans and chess playing machines and let them play together, they are better than both the best people and the best chess playing machines. And, and actually this was done by Gary Kasparov himself. Uh, so, so after losing and being very unhappy and grumpy and claiming that they were cheating and all kinds of stuff, uh, I guess he realized that, well, there's an opportunity here. Uh, so he then joined uh, the dark side and then started to develop this uh, system and then made a fortune out of that. Uh, but he was also the person that was behind this uh, competition, uh, called them Kentars, or, yeah, uh, where you have these combined human-machine teams uh, playing against each other. Uh, and and from, from his perspective was this, that the humans were still better at the kind of strategy level, so the kind of high-level thinking, while uh, the tactical level, okay, you want to achieve this, then the computer was significantly better than humans at that. Uh, so so the, the argument here is that the combinations of the AIs and humans are better than both the best humans and the best machines. However, it's actually the case that it's a different skill to play chess with the computer compared to playing chess on your own. So the people that were kind of winning these tournaments were not the grandmasters. They were good at chess, but not great. But they knew how to use these tools in an effective way. Uh, and so, so what kind of strategies to use or what to ask them and so on and so forth. Uh, so I actually think this is also very interesting, going back to this previous comment, that uh, the, the people that knows how to effectively use AI will outcompete those that don't. And it's the same here. Uh, and it's also the case that uh, uh, we have seen that in, in Sweden that it's also very much an organizational case uh, where that if you just introduce, uh, say, uh, computer-aided tools of different types into your organization, you don't do anything else, the outcome is usually worse. It's only when you adapt the way that you work and you adapt the, the kind of organizations to take advantage of these new tools that you get the benefit. And an example that uh, I usually use is that in Sweden, uh, they, they started to introduce computers into school uh, a number of I mean, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and then they did a study on that and came to the conclusion that uh, if you just introduce computers into the classroom, you don't really change anything else. The outcomes are worse than if you didn't do anything. But if you then also adapt the pedagogy and kind of adapt the way that you teach, then you get much more benefit. And I think this is the, the case here as well. It's, 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 it's not about buying more tools, it's about how do you integrate them into your organization and into the, the everyday work that you do. And this is where I see most organizations fail, 
they spend a lot of money on buying equipment, but they spend no money on how do we educate the people or how do we train the people, how do we change the way we do our business and so on. So, so I think that's where the opportunity is. But in the end, it's, it's not about either AI or people, but it's really about AI and people. That's the, the main message. Next, please. Uh, of course, we all know that now that we have mainly these data-driven uh, methods that I was mentioning in the previous talks, uh, we get a number of challenges. I mean, you know about this, first of all, bias. Uh, and actually, I think bias is very interesting because there are so many different types of bias. Uh, and, and I mean, the, the most common type of bias uh, is the way you have these data sets that do not represent reality. I mean, the classical example here uh, is when you had uh, face recognition systems that worked well for white men, but didn't work for colored women. Uh, and then start to look into, oh, why is this the case? Oh, well, they may have been collecting and training it on uh, white males. So, of course, that's bad, but it's easy to, or, or relatively easy to fix. And uh, it's more about how do you collect more data, how do you collect more representative data, and over time, your data sets should become more representative. So in some sense, that's a relatively straightforward problem. But then uh, there are other types of biases. Uh, for example, there was another uh, well-known case uh, that was uh, looking at uh, job ads being served uh, on, on internet services. And then it turned out that men were more likely to get an ad for a higher paying job than a woman who was more likely to get an ad for a lower paying job. And then it looked into the data that was being used to train the systems and came to the conclusion that, well, this is like the official statistics. So the problem is that the labor market is biased. That uh, jobs that are mostly women dominated tend to have lower salaries than jobs that are mainly male dominated. And now the question becomes, what do you do about that? Uh, so, so in some sense, the system was doing the, what you say, correct thing, if you're looking at the way uh, things are currently. So one of the ways, of course, that, oh, we should then suggest that uh, uh, a woman might get, oh, why don't you apply for this job? But, yeah, uh, and so on. So, so it's not clear how to do that. So, so it's, uh, uh, it's, in some sense, someone needs to make a normative statement that this is not the way we want the world to look like. Uh, and then you need to change or uh, basically adapt the data to the world that you want, rather to the way that the world is. Because collecting more data will not solve the problem. So that's the key issue. But then you have other interesting uh, challenges when it comes to this. Actually, going back to this, where you have different laws that are conflicting. Uh, so, so we did a, a project together with Swedish uh, uh, unemployment agency, uh, and of course, the Swedish unemployment agency is not allowed to discriminate. But now the question becomes: I mean, since the labor market is discriminating, they basically knew this person uh, is is, is uh, capable. I mean, is qualified for the job. But we know that this person will not get this job for other reasons. Now the question is, what is the, the least discriminatory? Is it to tell them that, oh, you should apply for this job, you're qualified for it, even though they know that the person will not get it? Or is it better to say that, well, you are qualified, but for other reasons, you, uh, it's probably better that you don't apply. Because the person is not fun to get denied uh, or rejected all the time. And I mean, what is the least uh, uh, and discriminatory in that case. And basically today, they basically have to do the first. They have to recommend that they apply for the job because they are not allowed to take into consideration that the labor market is discriminating. Uh, because basically, I mean, actually I think they've done, I mean, you've probably seen the study as well, that basically just looking at the name. So maybe the most, the, 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 the thing that would have increased your likelihoods the most would be change your name into a Swedish sounding name and then your chances of getting a job will increase, which of course is not particularly nice, but it would be the kind of, from an uh, effectiveness or accuracy point of view, would be the best. So, so I really think there are very interesting challenges when it comes to this, and where there is no clear, I mean, it's not easy to say what's right or wrong, and I think that's one of the main issues here. Next, please. Uh, Yes, so, so I mean another example uh, that's been quite popular is this with deep fakes or um, the fact that you can generate uh, data today, I mean both 
uh, images and text and video and sound that is basically indistinguishable from, from the real thing. Uh, so, so, I mean, these, these uh, faces, I should think this is old, I think it's from 2017, maybe even. Uh, so, so it's really an old picture, but uh, still it's interesting that uh, they, they, they look like normal people, but they're all computer generated. Uh, and of course, this puts a lot of challenges uh, to the system. And, and actually that's one of the main, well, one major argument against say, chat GPT and so on is that how we are going to uh, determine that something we read or something that we see is actually real and not just computer generated. Uh, and actually, I think here there are some, some interesting uh, directions towards watermarking, for example, that uh, it should be always possible to find out whether something has been computer generated or not. Uh, and I think this, for images, um, I think this makes a lot of sense because it's so easy to hide. You can hide the codes in the image and it will not be shown. It will still be part of the image. Uh, so, so I think there is relatively straightforward and it's relatively rare that you kind of cut out pieces of an image and, and put them together and so on. So, so I think it probably would work quite well for images, but if you take text, how are you going to hide watermarks and text? Then it must be in some other metadata. And if someone just cuts a paste, I mean, it will be lost. And of course, also with, with text, I mean, I mean, this is actually, uh, I had a, a PhD student that was defending his PhD thesis at the end of last year, and then you have to send it into one of his plagiarism control system. And it's like, oh, you're using the a lot. And then it's like really strange. You know, like, uh, things that like, uh, it was pointing out a lot of things in the text that was just standard things. And uh, that there was, oh, this is a lot of similarities with existing things. Yes, of course, it's cut the piece, and it's a lot of uh, small things. So, so I really think it would have been much, much more difficult when it comes to text, because it's you can you can recombine it in so many different ways, and you can you can uh, it's hard to hide this kind of watermarking. And I also don't really believe in these systems that claim that they should be able to detect whether something is computer generated or not. Uh, and uh, because I mean the, the most common usage is of say ChatGPT for generating text is not just to cut and paste the generated text as it is, but then you do a bit of uh, editing afterwards, uh, and then. Where do you draw the line? Is it 80% generated, 90%, 10%? Yeah. Uh, so, so I think for text, it will be extremely difficult, if not impossible. But anyway, I mean, I really think this is putting a lot of challenges on, on different kind of systems and, and so on. And I mean, to me, it seems to be that uh, we have to have a different approach towards uh, uh, this kind of source criticism and so on. Uh, but I also think it will put a lot of challenges on, on security. As I mean, um, today, I mean, one major way of getting into facilities where you're not supposed to be is, of course, through social engineering. Uh, you, you try to convince people that, well, you come up with all kinds of good reasons why they should let you in and so on. But that uh, is quite costly and quite hard. So what you can do now is, of course, to scale this up. Uh, you can basically call everyone in a company and say, oh, I'm your boss, using the correct voice of the correct boss, uh, and saying that, oh, can you please open this door for me, or whatever, uh, uh, do something for me that they shouldn't be doing. And you can take any organization, and there will be a lot of people that fall for it. Actually, we had a case at the, the university, was one of these phishing attacks, and there were several people at the computer science department that did the thing. So even the people that were supposed to be aware of these things. I mean, they, I mean, they're good. I mean, they're good at doing these things, and people fall for them. Uh, so, so that I think is a challenge. How do you deal with scaling up of all these social engineering attacks? So, so I think there's a lot of interest. But of course, there's also possibilities. Uh, so, so one uh, positive usage is was this was uh, journalists uh, interviewing people that they were have to hide their identity. I mean, traditionally, kind of put them behind the blanket, to scramble the voice, and, and, yeah. But now what they can do instead is just give them a new voice, give them a new face, and it looks like they're interviewing a person, uh, but you're still hiding the identity of the person. So, so that's another one usage. Another usage is, uh, is synthetic data in general. So if you take, for example, medical data, we also talked about law enforcement uh, agencies. 
uh, and that have sensitive data, but where there's a lot of value in the data, for example, in medical data, if we can understand diseases better, we can uh, help uh, uh, cure other people and so on. Uh, so what you can do there is basically train these kind of models instead of generating people, you generate patients uh, that are uh, not connected to any particular individual, but you're learning models of patients and then you're generating synthetic patients that have the same properties as the real patients. And then you can do the down downstream tasks uh, on this synthetic data. Uh, so of course, that's a very interesting uh, use case. Um, so there's a lot of uh, interest in, in synthetic data, but uh, there's also challenges. Actually, I saw a paper the other day uh, where they basically are using the synthetic data to train systems downstream. Uh, and it works if you do it like once, but then of course the tendency is that, well, then you use further generated data to, to generate train it further. And at some point it just becomes garbage. Uh, so it's okay to use a little bit of uh, synthetic data or to use it like one step further down, but if you kind of uh, feed just generated data to the systems, they, they kind of complete, become completely pointless. And of course, that's another one of these risks or, or, or things that people argue that when we get chat GPT and these kind of systems, it's just flooding the system with generated data, uh, and then in the next, in a few months, years, whatever, uh, that will be the basis for future training of systems. And that will be a problem. So, so I think there are some interest, uh, yeah, some challenges there. But synthetic data is also a positive use of this kind of technology. So again, I think that the, the, um, one of the challenges here is that the technology is, is we would say, it can be used for both good and bad things. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not claim that the technology is completely neutral, but at least it, it's more the, the application than the technology itself that is causing the problems. And to me, that's the, the thing that we want to regulate and the things that we want to make sure that it, it works as intended. Next, please. Uh, well, we can skip this thing. Uh, and, and then uh, another thing which I find very, very fascinating is this question of how do we evaluate AI systems? Uh, so um, the example I'm using here is from one of these uh, AlphaGo uh, games against the uh, 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 so, uh, of course, everyone knows that the computer won, so that's not the interesting part. Uh, the interesting part is actually to look at the human expert commentators that were commentating these games, and there's fascinating uh, documentary about this. Uh, and, and basically what happens is that uh, the computer was making moves that the human experts thought were completely stupid and that Basically, the computer made a mistake, and well, a human would never play like that. And, and here we have this interesting situation where objectively the move was good because the computer won. So apparently, it was objectively a good move to make. But from the human expert perspective, it looked like a bad move. Now, of course, this was just a game of Go, which to most people doesn't as well. It's not a matter of life and death. But assume now instead that it was a, a medical recommendation system. So you are a medical doctor, you're using one of these medical recommendation systems, and it's making a recommendation to you that from your experience, from your knowledge, it makes absolutely no sense. But now the interesting question of on what grounds should you follow the recommendations or on what grounds should you not follow the recommendation? There's no neutral choice. You have to select either one of those, but and how do you make that choice? And, and, and I think that's that's a really the crucial question. I mean, how do we determine, how do we evaluate the quality of the recommendations? Because I, I think in most cases it would be recommendations rather than assistants actually doing it, <clears throat> or completely autonomous. And, 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 and of course, both choices can be equally bad. I mean, <clears throat> if you follow the recommendations, and with the bad recommendations, well, the patient might be in harm. Uh, if it was a good recommendation and you didn't follow it, the patient might be in harm. So there is no neutral choice. And you have to make this choice. Uh, but here, I think uh, I think there, there is a lot of interesting psychology. <clears throat> uh, so I think following the recommendations will be seen as making an active, uh, uh, doing an action, I mean, active action. But yeah, being active which means that then you have to take the responsibility. 
if you do not follow recommendations, you just do what well what you would otherwise have done. People will probably blame you less. They will probably blame you more if you follow the recommendation and the recommendation was wrong. Uh, actually, I, I saw a, a study, or at least heard about the study, uh, where they were look, uh, looking into this trolley problem. Uh, basically, you have to select who, who survives, uh, and and then, but they did it with a twist. That uh, first they used people. So if the people was supposed to change the, the, the gear to, to determine which track uh, the trolley should go to. So basically the person would decide who, who lives and who dies. There was very clear that if the person did an active change, if it changed uh, the gear, then the person was responsible. If the person did nothing and just ran over whoever, however many people, it was okay. And actually, I don't know it in Brazil, but in Sweden, there is actually no law that I mean, if you see someone drowning and there is one of these life things, boys, whatever you call them, uh, you're not you're not you're not required to try to save the person. I know in some countries you are, you must try to save the person. So, so I think it's probably yeah, also in regulations. But now, in in the case where you had a robot. Now it was a robot that was supposed to throw the, change the switch. Then people's perception changed. That even if the robot did nothing and it could have saved people, it should have done it. So, so I think here we will have an interesting question that it depends on uh, our notion of active participation, actively doing things that will, will depend, I mean, uh, influence how the outcome will be interpreted. Uh, so, so I think these very, very interesting questions. Next, please. Which now, so I mean, basically now I said a little bit about, I mean, what, what's happening, but also a little bit what are the challenges. So now the next part is, so what have we been doing in, in Europe? Uh, so as I said, uh, this uh, high-level expert group was formed, I never remember, but I think it was in 2018 that we started. Um, uh, and then we were given a task to basically do two things. Uh, one thing was to develop these ethical guidelines for trustworthy AI, which we did, but we also did uh, develop policy recommendations. Uh, so that, uh, well, what are the changes that, or what are the policies needed to actually take advantage of AI? That hasn't got that same uh, attraction uh, as the, the ethical guidelines. But, uh, and so uh, I, I think Europe has taken a very good approach in the sense that, uh, yes, we do want AI, but we don't want any AI. We want this AI that we actually can trust. And also the fact that AI in itself is not the point, but rather that the point is how do we use AI to make lives better for, for people in general. Uh, so I think that the kind of starting point is good. Uh, and then uh, what we did was then define what we mean by trustworthy AI. And uh, what we defined was then that in order to be trustworthy, uh, there are three things that you need to satisfy. Uh, the first thing is that you need to follow the applicable uh, uh, rules and regulations, which of course it sounds perfectly uh, obvious, uh, but I think there are a number of consequences of, of that choice. For example, uh, if you take the example of a self-driving car, uh, uh, whether it should violate a traffic rule in order to potentially prevent an accident. So, for example, you might be having an autonomous car uh, coming and someone in front of it slams the brakes uh, and the car will not have a time to, to brake in time to not hit the car in front of it, but it could drive over the solid line and kind of enter the, the opposite lane. Now the question is, if it goes into the opposite lane, there is no accident. What will be the thing? Will it be still, but, well, you broke the, you broke the law. Uh, there were no accidents, so there were no reason for you not to break the law. So, well, you're in trouble. Uh, while if you don't break the law, there is an accident, of course, it will also be trouble. But my, my guess there is that uh, the car companies would prefer to have the accident than to uh, break the law. Because you can never, you can, it's so difficult, it's basically impossible to uh, argue why you are breaking the law. Uh, in preventive purposes. I mean, why are you building a system that may break the law? It doesn't matter because I think just you will never win that argument. Uh, so therefore, it's better just to have the accident. Actually, there is a lot of other interesting aspects of that when it comes to self-driving car and safety. So who are you going to protect? The people in the car 
are the people outside of the car. Well, the people in the car are your customers, so should you protect your customers, or the people outside. Uh, but on the other hand, the people outside are probably the more vulnerable, especially if it's pedestrians. So the people in the car, they are protected, partially protected at least. Uh, so I think there are so many interesting uh, questions regarding that. But that's that's separate. But anyway, uh, first of all, it has to be lawful, following the rules and regulations. Uh, secondly, uh, it has to satisfy uh, a number of ethical principles. Uh, we defined four ethical principles. I have them on the next slide. Uh, and then last but definitely not least, the way, which actually I think still uh, is kind of uh, uh, different compared to most other similar uh, approaches, is that good intentions are not enough. You actually have to have a safe and robust implementation. It's actually the way you built the system that counts, not how you wanted it to no, ideally work. And, and I really think this, this is really key, that, that it's actually what you build that counts, not what you kind of wanted to build or plan to build. Uh, and, and if these three are satisfied, then we can argue that this is trustworthy. Then, of course, uh, we have the, the next challenge, and that is that it's very easy to state these principles. You, you also mentioned it in your presentation that, yeah, it's, I mean, you can have these broad principles, but how do you actually interpret them? How do you actually uh, operationalize them in working systems, whether it's legal systems or autonomous systems? Uh, and, and I mean, that is where, where I argue where we're currently at. This is the, the challenge we're trying to address today. Uh, and, and that's this, this data network that we're on coordinating is trying to address. But we actually did some things. So uh, from these four principles, we defined seven requirements. And we also made uh, an assessment list. So basically a set of questions uh, that you should ask yourself in order to uh, determine whether you are uh, meeting these requirements or not. Uh, so, so we did a few steps uh, during our two years uh, of this uh, expert group uh, towards this. But again, I think this is this is, of course, a major, also a major topic. How do you verify that you are living up to this? How are you monitoring this? How are you enforcing it? And so on and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the ethical principles that we defined uh, were, uh, first of all, that you should respect human autonomy, uh, which means that these systems should augment, complement, and empower people rather than the opposite. Uh, and, uh, um, yeah, I think this is relatively straightforward, but uh, we can take the example of, of e-governance, or at least governance in general, where uh, certain, I mean, in some sense you have the regulation in order to make people to make better choices. So uh, we can take a less intrusive example. You might download an app on your phone, uh, which helps you to uh, eat more healthy or to exercise more. That's probably okay. You have a kind of a configured app, you can take it away and so on and so forth. So you, you're still in charge, even though the whole point of the app is to change your behavior, to make you do things that you otherwise wouldn't do. Uh, but now assume that your insurance agency said that, well, if you install this app, you eat more uh, healthy, you exercise more, you get a 20% reduction in your premium. Is that okay? Now we're kind of, uh, yeah, you can make a trade-off, either you pay more or you have to do this. <clears throat> Maybe still okay, but now we take it to the next level where the government says that we want, uh, we are going to increase the health uh, of our population. So now everyone needs to uh, do these exercises and everyone needs to, to eat more healthy. Is that okay? Then, then you might not have a choice that you have to move to a different country, which might be not really realistic. Uh, uh, so, so then it's become a challenge. So, so we can take this example of respecting human autonomy, and, and I mean, there are a scale where certain things are probably perfectly fine, and other things are much more unclear, and things in between. I mean, there was these discussions when it comes to COVID tracking apps. So for example, in Sweden, we didn't have any COVID tracking, basically. Uh, not any kind of on a large scale, while in other countries it was mandatory to to basically track wherever you were, uh, so that you can follow everything. 
<clears throat> and I think this is one of those examples where you are overriding people's autonomy. Uh, we also discussed explicitly the case of proactive, uh, or say, uh, not governance, but the, for example, that oh, if you have a kid when they're getting to the age where they have to start school, instead of you as a parent have to apply to start school, why don't I mean they know that the, I mean age is kind of linear, so we know when things will happen. So we just well now your uh, kid is this age. Here is the information you need, or uh, you get sick, uh, and then uh, you, you go to the hospital, then you automatically kind of uh, looking up all the things you need. Or now there is a new rule that you can, uh, you're actually entitled to some benefit. You might not even know it. So then you kind of proactively, from the government point of view, informing the citizens about things that they should do. And actually, I think this was one case where we were more, nah, this is probably too, too invasive, actually, this kind of proactive government. But, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> sorry. The second one uh, is prevention of harm. Actually, I actually think this is probably the least problematic, unless, of course, you've read all Isaac Asimov's stories, because that's basically very much about this. Uh, are you going to you know, kill the, the terrorists or yeah, so on and so forth? But in general, everyone agrees that you want these systems to be safe and secure. You should protect physical and mental integrity and so on. Uh, there could be some interesting cases. I mean, actually, this case of uh, yeah, if you have a terrorist or something, and should you kill that person? It's actually a question of individual safety versus group safety. Uh, and I think this is one aspect which mostly when you think about these things, it's, all, uh, it's always from the individual's point of view. It's one individual and how that particular individual is uh, influenced and uh, affected by these uh, systems or these tools. But it actually becomes quite interesting if you take a community perspective or group perspective, especially when we take into the next one when it comes to fairness, uh, which is very much about uh, groups uh, having equal opportunities and, and so on and so forth. So, so I really think it's also very interesting to think about uh, not only the individuals, but also in terms of groups. And actually, it might be the case that I mean, we have this uh, with kind of affirmative actions. So, if, for example, you have few women at the computer science departments, maybe we should uh, actively uh, increase the number of women because otherwise it would just maintain whatever it is and so on. That you need to take affirmative action to uh, get change the balance. And then when the balance has been restored, then you can remove these affirmative actions and so on. So I, I think there is quite a lot of interesting aspects there. But of course, the, the fairness, uh, again, fairness is one of these things that Everyone agrees upon that, yes, of course, the systems should be fair until we start to discuss how do you kind of define fairness or what do you mean by fair? Is it fair out, should it kind of uh, equal outcome or should it be equal sharing of resources? Uh, because, of course, if you want equal outcome, then you have to have an unequal distribution of resources because people will need different amount of resources to get to the same place. Uh, or should it be equal uh, distribution of resources? And then people will be unevenly or differently good at using these resources. So, so I think there's a lot of very interesting aspects there. And of course, we have these kind of affirmative actions and so on. I, I remember I saw a study on uh, basically it was banks uh, that I mean it was I mean one of these standard kind of examples is always I mean should that person get a loan or not. Uh, and, and actually, what they could show there was that if someone got a loan that they actually cannot deal with, it's a bigger problem than if they don't get the loan. And the problem is that if you get a loan that you cannot repay, uh, you, you get so many kind of uh, rep or say, repercussions. Uh, so, so, so actually, that was a problem where, for example, yeah, in order to not care about, for example, because if you go back to this previous case where a uh, labor market is uh, biased, which means that if you're from a certain group, ethnicity, for example, you're less likely to get the job. So even if you look at all the other criteria, your education and where you live and so on, you look like, oh, you should, you should, there should be no problem for you repaying this loan. But due to, for example, uh, labor market discrimination, the person would not get the job or the salary that they want to get and therefore they get the loan that they can repay. So if you take away 
this kind of discrimination in some sense. You're actually uh, hurting the people rather than helping them. And, and I really think that's, of course, challenging <laughs> uh, uh, to deal with. So, so again, it's not an easy question. Uh, and last, uh, we have explicability, uh, which is everything around, say, transparency, uh, explanations. I don't really like explanations because no one can explain what an explanation is. But uh, anyway, this kind of more openness with capabilities and purposes and so on. Uh, so I really think it's about understanding on whose behalf the system works, how the system works, what the system can and cannot do, and so on and so forth. So, so everything around that. Uh, so these are the, the four uh, principles that we uh, defined. Uh, as you're probably aware, there are a large number of similar uh, uh, principles, usually a bit more around 10 since the, the normal, but uh, if you look at what they actually cover, uh, I think they cover more or less the, the same things. Yes, next please. Uh, so, so these were the ethical guidelines that we presented, I believe, in 2019. Um, and then uh, what's now happening in, in Europe is that they're trying to make these into law. Uh, so actually there was one very kind of interesting discussion within this expert group uh, was regarding the, the kind of more soft law versus hard law. Uh, and it was very clear that, for example, consumer organizations were very much for hard law. They want to have uh, fines and liabilities and uh, all these kind of things. And of course, companies and so on were more towards the soft regulation side. Uh, but anyway, uh, now, uh, the, or actually since what is it, since 2021, I think that uh, right before summer 2021 came the, the first uh, draft uh, of this AI Act, uh, where they said that we will take a risk-based approach. Uh, so basically the amount of regulation will be in, in relation to the amount of risk associated uh, with the application. Uh, and at the top, we have uh, applications with unacceptable risks uh, that actually should be prohibited. Uh, there were four uh, such applications, if I remember correctly, in the, in the original draft. There was a subliminal manipulation. And then, of course, someone could argue, is that uh, advertising? Isn't that all about uh, subliminal manipulation? Uh, or, say, uh, election campaigns and so on? Anyway, uh, of course, marketeers don't say it's information to make you Anyway, never mind. Uh, but the uh, subliminal uh, manipulation was what? Uh, this social credit scoring, so kind of uh, scoring populations at a large scale was another one. Uh, the third one was remote uh, biometrical identification. Well, we should probably interpret that as face recognition, but basically it's about uh, in public spaces, in real time, uh, identifying people um, who they are. There was three, uh, maybe it was the fourth. I don't really remember those three. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of discussions. Uh, I think when it comes to, I don't think anyone is arguing for social credit scoring, but at the same time, I would argue we still have it, but we have it in more subtle uh, versions. Um, uh, of the, the one that's most discussed is, of course, this remote biometrical identification where law enforcement agencies and so on, of course, want to be able to use it. Uh, actually, I think the if you remember the, the latest um, status is that the added is real time. So it's only if you do it in real time that it counts, uh, which means that I don't know if you wait, do it 10 seconds delay, maybe it's okay. Uh, so, so I'm sure there will be ways around it, but, but um, anyway, that's one of the, the, one of the big discussion items. Uh, and then uh, the second category is the high risk. And this is basically everything where the, the system influenced the uh, the well-being of people in some respects, so for example, uh, medical systems or hiring systems and uh, different types of evaluation systems. Uh, so the in, intention here is that if you have one of these high-risk systems, then there will be quite a lot of uh, uh, regulation associated with that. But on the other hand, the intention is that this should be a relatively small set of applications. Uh, and my, my prediction here is that that will not work out that way. My expectation is that probably most systems will either be considered high risk or treated as high risk. Because if you take it from a, 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 a procure, procurement perspective, 
you might say, oh, I'm not sure, maybe is this high risk or not? Let's, let's be on the safe side. Let's just assume that it's high risk and then we don't take any risk. Uh, or you can say that I'm a developer of a system. I don't know, you're doing a spreadsheet system, but how do you know if they're not using your spreadsheet system for, I don't know, making bombs or uh, scheduling nurses or whatever? And I mean, so the, the thing is that, oh, I don't know where my system is going to be used, uh, so I have to build it assuming that it will be used in high-risk uh, situations. So my, my expectation is that most systems will be either considered uh, or in practice uh, approached as high risk. <clears throat> and, and here we also have this ex ante conformative assessment, basically before you put uh, the product onto the market, you need to satisfy this. And of course, this is one of the, the challenges that it has to be before you put it on market. And, and there is one more challenge, uh, and that is that uh, this applies no matter where the system was built. I mean, you, I remember some of you mentioned in the talks that uh, regulation applies to anything that's being used in the EU. So it doesn't matter if it's developed in, in South America or Europe where it developed it. It's still, if it's going to be used on the European market, it has to satisfy its requirements. Uh, but it also seems that it also applies if you have open source tools. So if you are putting an open source tool available, and basically, if you just make it available to people to download and use, they claim that, well, this can be considered to put it on the market, which would basically kill open source, because the whole point is that you don't want to take any responsibility of it. I'm just making it available for anyone else to use if they want to, under their own risk. But some interpretations say that, no, 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 you will have to take responsibility for this. So this is, again, one of these things that are currently being discussed. What are the consequences for open source? Uh, uh, and then uh, transparency risk. I honestly haven't really heard anyone talk about that one. Uh, so I don't think that's particularly important. It's more the high risk part that's, that's most important. And of course, this expectation that uh, a large number of applications would be minimal or no risk. Uh, and of course, the expectation is that, oh, you have your industrial robots in your uh, factory, they share a lot of data or they're doing a lot of things, there is like a minimal risk. Uh, so, so maybe that would be the case. Next piece. Uh, and if you're considered high risk, uh, then there is a lot of uh, requirements. So, so and these have changed uh, somewhat, but uh, in, in, in prepping, which they they're, they're, in essence, they're, they're more or less the same, and, and in essence, they're also following requirements that we uh, developed in this uh, ethical guidelines quite quite uh, straightforwardly. Uh, but one of the things that has been discussed a lot is this, that in the original formulation, it said that the training data has to be complete and free of errors. And if you ever work with any system, you know that that's impossible. There is no data set that's complete or free of errors. And who is going to determine what an error is anyway? Uh, what, I mean, if you have a weather data, I mean, what is the correct weather? Uh, I, mean, I don't know if it's well defined even. Uh, so, so now I think they changed it. So to the extent possible, complete and error free. But still, I think this is one major challenge. And uh, we talked about this conflict between uh, regulation. Uh, and here, of course, we have one conflict, namely between GDPR, which has data minimization. Uh, as one of the, the requirements. And here you basically have data maximization as a requirement. That in order to satisfy this, you should collect as much data as possible. And you're required to do it. Uh, and of course, the answer when you ask the, the regulators, they say, well, both laws apply, so you have to follow both. <laughs> uh, and then there's also this uh, yeah, logging. So basically, that uh, if something goes wrong, you have to be able to trace what happened through the system. And again, if you have a system which is dealing with personal information, then you need to save this personal information. So what, uh, what's the consequence of GDPR there? If you have this right to be forgotten, if you ask, I want you to remove all my data, are you, how do you deal with this? Which, which rules should you violate? Uh, and so on. And also, human oversight, um, uh, it's one of these things that uh, keeping the humans in the loop and involved in the process 
Okay, it's a very important requirement, but how do you do it in, in practice? And I would argue there are, there are these kind of autonomous systems which rely on the fact that humans are not involved, say, a, a um, uh, what's it called? Uh, airbag, airbag in a car. I mean, the whole point is that you don't have the chance to react, but the system is able to make life and death decisions much faster than we, and they can expand the airbag and hopefully save the lives. But if you expand the airbag at the wrong time, you could actually cause an accident. So it's really about making life and death decisions, and you don't want any humans involved in those decisions. Uh, and I think there are probably other examples. So, so, so it's, it's not clear. But anyway, uh, these are then the, the requirements. And let's see what next image is. I don't remember exactly what it took. Yes, I, I added this image. Uh, so the, the point here is not to read the details, but rather that uh, one of the kind of criticism or one of the comments about this AI act, of course, how do you define all these things? What do they mean? What does it mean to have a, a complete and error-free data set? Uh, and basically now the answer is that, well, the regulations will not answer that, but that will be uh, deferred to standardization. Uh, so basically I've given a task to the European standardization organization, CEN and CEN, CEN, CEN -LEC. Uh, to develop standards for all these things uh, with the interesting caveat that if you don't finish on time or if you don't like or if we don't like the standards that you develop we will make a decision uh, and, and I think the timeline is extremely compressed I think they basically have to be done next year uh, so so yeah, I have no clue how we're going to complete this and but but they're, they're, they're basically uh, one consequence of this is that a lot of the regulation will be determined by standardization and the argument is that well now we're giving the uh, stakeholders the developers you now can basically set up reasonable standards as long as we agree that they're reasonable you can decide them yourself uh, so they see it as an offer and kind of an opportunity uh, and so on. So, so, and then of course we have the whole standardization processes which are not democratic and basically you have to pay to get a seat and you have to pay to get access to the standards. Actually, I think they made a decision that these standards will be available for free, but, uh, uh, but still it, it's, you know, it's an interesting business. And actually there's a lot more to talk about standards, but I will just leave it for now. Um, uh, saying that uh, standardization will be a very important part and uh, the intention is to do European standards rather than to kind of go with the international standards because one wants to maintain control of this uh, and uh, if you're interested in getting involved in standardization I guess this is the time. Uh, next please. Yes, um, so I'm, I have no clue uh, how uh, well, actually, we probably should be supposed to be finished many hours ago. Uh, and, um, but I can say a few words about this, this project. So, so uh, uh, one of the major challenges with all these requirements and all these uh, principles so is, of course, how do we actually realize them in technical systems? Uh, and I really think that's, that, that's really a hard problem. Uh, and therefore, we created this network uh, called Taylor. Uh, where uh, that I'm coordinating, we have 54 partners in 20 countries, uh, and uh, we are then developing the scientific foundations for trustworthy AI. Uh, and we want to do this through the integration of learning, optimization, and reasoning. So, so we don't believe that any of the kind of any single technique will be able to solve all these problems. But rather, we need to combine different types of techniques uh, to achieve this. Next, please. Yeah, so I've already said this, but the division is then to yeah, develop these scientific foundations so that we can realize this European vision of the human-centered, trustworthy AI. Next, please. Uh, and basically, the, the, the rationale behind this uh, is this uh, uh, cognitive psychology perspective where uh, we have these two different systems. Uh, we have the system two, uh, which is then the slow, explicit, deliberate, uh, effortful uh, uh, system where we basically make rational decisions. So in some sense this is the uh, prototypical analytical decision making, which is basically what we do most of the days. Uh, we are formulating problems and we're solving them using uh, 
different types of methods in a, in a quite systematic uh, manner. Uh, and I would argue that well, this kind of good old fashioned or traditional AI uh, has been all about how we mechanize that type of reasoning and rational uh, decision making processes. And I would argue it's been quite successful. Uh, at the same time, we also have this other system, system one, uh, the fast, the implicit, uh, the effortless system, uh, which just kind of works. Uh, and of course, the prototypical example here is intuition, where we, if we get the question or if we're facing a problem, we intuitively feel what is the right uh, answer or the right approach, uh, but we don't know how it came to that uh, conclusion. We have no introspection into the process. Uh, and I would argue this very uh, kind of is quite well aligned with this more data driven machine learning approaches, which most of the time works very well. It's hard to explain exactly how to do, even though, of course, mathic and mathematic, we know exactly how things are computed. So it's deterministic in that respect, but it's not explainable in some kind of high level symbolic terms. Uh, but of course, it also can make mistakes. Uh, and I would argue that the human perception system is the same. I mean, we're extremely good at recognizing people and recognizing objects, but I, I don't know anyone that can actually explain how did you know that that was your friend, that was just a spot uh, on the horizon uh, that you saw and you could instinctively uh, detect who it was. How can you explain that there was this person? Uh, so, so I think this, uh, and of course this is very useful, uh, so what we want to do is, of course, how do we combine these two different approaches? So the more data-driven machine learning approaches, the more symbolic knowledge-based approaches, uh, where you have a lot of guarantees. How do you combine these together? That's in some sense the, the challenge. Next please. Uh, and uh, we have done a number of things. We have developed a strategic research innovation roadmap. Uh, so basically, what are the challenges going forward? Next please. Uh, and the other, so there were originally four uh, of these networks. Now they have added more networks. I don't know, maybe it's eight or nine right now. Uh, but at least these four uh, networks that started out, we have all done our own strategic research agendas. Uh, and the last year we have now uh, joined these. So uh, I have led the work together with uh, Jessica Montgomery from Elise uh, on uh, how do we put this together to a joint strategic research agenda. So if you take the next slide, please. Uh, so this was presented right before the summer in, in June. Uh, we presented this, so we have identified eight kind of high-level research challenges. Uh, and of course, this is then related to AI and robotics. Uh, there are a number of interesting uh, observations here. Uh, one observation is that we have uh, generalized, so we don't write AI, but we write ADR, which stands for AI, Data and Robotics. As uh, so what we see is that we're really trying to achieve this convergence between these different areas of AI data and robotics. Uh, and therefore we see that there is a lot of uh, joint uh, problems and of course a lot of added value in, in collaborating. So, so therefore we're using this ADR instead. So building the technical foundations for safe and trustworthy ADR, integrating AI into deployed and embedded systems, uh, enhancing human capabilities with collaborative ADR, Accelerates research and innovation, so this was what I mentioned in the introduction, basically accelerate science itself. Uh, understanding interactions between ADR, social needs and social technical system. So these are all about taking this broader perspective. I mean, the, these technical systems are working in a larger context. Uh, and advancing the fundamental theories, models and methods, so this is basically the, the basic science part, the basic research part. Uh, insurance and legal compliance, so how do we uh, satisfy all these uh, regulations and so on that I just talked about. Uh, and then we also add a, a, a new one here on advancing hardware for safe and energy efficient interaction between ADR technologies, humans and environment. So, so basically the physical component is also uh, important. So these are then the high level uh, challenges. There are much more detail, if you take the next slide just for so we just listed a lot of the topics that we're covering. Uh, so there are a lot of different topics that are being uh, included. I should say that the focus is more towards the kind of technical side, but uh, yeah, 
that's that's more due to the, the people that were involved. But I think there is room for and uh, what should I say, uh, further development will also be uh, much broader. So this was the first version of this joint strategic research agenda. Uh, it will be updated in a year uh, before the, the, the four original networks end. Next, please. Uh, yeah, so we have a basic research program. So basically, we have five areas that we're working in trustworthy AI, uh, paradigms and representations. So, this is basically how do we do different kind of combinations, so uh, neurosymbolic and so on. Uh, then we have three. Uh, 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 Verticals, namely acting, so reasoning and learning for acting, uh, reasoning and learning for social AI, and auto AI, basically, how do we automate and, uh, the processes uh, of developing systems? So, there today, machine learning and AI in general is very manual. There's a lot of manual work going on, selecting, say, the architecture style and selecting the hyperparameters and doing all these things. So, how can we automate more the processes uh, around that? Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so so basically, when it comes to uh, trustworthy AI, we are following the ethical guidelines, of course. Uh, so we have these different six dimensions of trustworthy. Next, please. Uh, we have also developed a handbook uh, of trustworthy AI. Uh, I think it was released about a year ago, uh, where where we have uh, different types of uh, areas uh, which we're covering these different six dimensions. Uh, so here you can get the summary of the kind of state of the art, uh, what are the challenges and so on uh, in several of these. And of course, this is intended to be an open and extendable project. Uh, so it's built on Jupyter notebooks. Uh, so, so we can also change it uh, over time. Next, please. Uh, we have done, so we have done a number of, of course, more spe specific uh, research projects. I, I, for, I will skip them, but we have, we have done surveys and explain by assistance. Next, please. So actually, I added one slide on some work that we are doing ourselves. We have some of work that we actually do in my own research group, and that's related to synthetic data that I have mentioned several times. Uh, so, so basically, the intention is that we take this sensitive data, uh, we learn a generative model uh, of this sensitive data, uh, and then we sample this model in a structured way so that we get a new data set uh, which is the non-sensitive in the sense that uh, it, you cannot uh, refer, I mean, identify individuals that are here. Uh, so basically, you can remove certain properties and you want to keep certain other properties. So for example, you want to be able to use this for downstream uh, uh, classification tasks, uh, but you don't want it to be identifiable who it is. So this is something we've been working with. Uh, we have a paper now coming up at ECAI, the European AI conference, uh, on the latest result, where we basically uh, learn uh, latent um, diffusion models, uh, so we can make them fair, as we have basically learning a fair representation of the data that we can then use to generate uh, different types of uh, models and so on. Uh, so so uh, we have done some work there. Uh, next, please. Uh, when it comes to these paradigms and representations, it's all about how do we combine different approaches, so we're about more logic-based approaches, more uh, probabilistic approaches and neural approaches. So of course, this was the uh, further back. Uh, the probabilistic approaches was like the 90s and early 2000s, and of course, the last 15 years or so, it's been based in mainly the neural approaches. Uh, and we are much interested in how do we combine this uh, different approaches. So, for example, uh, statistical relational learning. How do you do uh, probabilities, but instead of doing it over grounded, uh, grounded formulas, how do you do it over relational formulas and so on. Uh, neurosymbolic approaches is very popular these days. So, how do we combine neural networks with more logic-based approaches? Uh, and there are a number of different approaches to doing that. Uh, so, that's one area where we are working. And I should say, this is led by uh, Luc Devart from KU Leuven. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so this is the neurosymbolic approaches. Next, please. Uh, and then we have the, the work, uh, the area around uh, learning and reasoning for action. So again, it's about how do we take, I mean, we have more traditional planning, which is usually very 
uh, is, is symbolic. You have reinforcement learning, uh, which is more uh, learning based. And now the question is, how can we combine this? Uh, so, for example, we have a, a, a research group in my division uh, where we're looking at basically using machine learning to learn both the representations and the planning domains. Uh, but uh, so basically, just by observing uh, a game, for example, you learn the rules for playing the game, and then you can then use traditional planning techniques to generate plans. Uh, another uh, work, uh, so this is led by uh, Yako uh, Mode, uh, sorry, Giuseppe Di Giacomo uh, from uh, University of Sapienza. Well, he's in Oxford now, but he used to be at Sapienza. Uh, and there, what we're interested in is non Markovian reinforcement learning. So instead of just learning a simple state to action mapping, we're learning an automata. Uh, so you can learn a more general uh, representation, which is the non Markovian. It's actually the, the history of your actions influence what you do today. So you have state uh, in your mapping. Uh, so, so that's one example of how we're pushing the frontiers there. Next. Uh, and then we have the, the work package more on social AI, learning and reasoning for social AI. And this is led by Anna Paiva from uh, uh, University of Lisbon. Uh, and uh, one thing here that's very interesting is this. Do we need a theory of mind in order to really build these kind of intelligent agents? And of course, the relation between theory of mind and large language models. Do they have a theory of mind or do they need one? Uh, is one example. Um, so uh, we can see, of course, that if you want to interact with people, having a theory of mind is really important because otherwise you cannot interpret why uh, people do what they do. So, so this is one example. Next, please. Yeah, and here we have one example application. Uh, so this was done by uh, Theo Delft, uh, Neil York Smith, Smith and colleagues, uh, where they were actually using uh, this uh, kind of agent-based simulation to study the effects of policy recommendations. So basically, there was some more about the, uh, yeah, should you allow Airbnb and so on. So basically, making policy decisions uh, regarding uh, housing. And then they could study the effects of different policy choices so that the policymakers can make better informed choices, make better decisions by using these kind of agent based simulations to. In, uh, 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 yeah, compare different policy approaches. Next. Yes, and, and uh, so, so this was just some examples of things that we we're doing in Taylor. I, I think in general, looking at AI uh, in broader, I, I think one of the challenges that we're facing is that currently we are basically doing correlation-based learning. We're looking for you know, just patterns in data, and these kind of patterns can be very useful and very valuable. But if we want to really uh, push uh, the frontiers further, uh, I think we need to move towards more causal models, especially if we want to do action, if we want to know, for example, policy changes. We actually want to change the world, then we need to know yeah, what we should change. Um, I mean, one of the classical examples is this, that oh, uh, the, there's a strong correlation between the amount of ice cream being sold and the number of people down, uh, drowning. So, but then of course, it would not make much difference if you make it legal to sell ice cream, that will not make fewer people drown because that's not a causal relation, but rather it's causal that it's hot outside, so people go buy ice cream and they go swimming and, and yeah, probably not at the same time. Right? Um, so, so then it's an example of, you need to have this kind of causal understanding. Uh, so I think that's one direction we need to go in. Uh, the second direction is, of course, that uh, now we see more this data kind of either completely data based, uh, data driven approaches, learning based approaches, or we see the kind of the knowledge based approaches. I think we need to combine these and get both take advantage of the adaptivity and so on of these learning based approaches, but we can also take advantage of the guarantees and the structures that we get from more uh, formal reasoning based approaches. Uh, for example, what uh, people are trying to do. Uh, actually, so an example where that managed to, uh, so I think it was in Chinese, that managed to just by observing the input output behavior of a, uh, a processor, they managed to build, construct a copy of that processor. 
so the only input I had was that this is the signals we send into the processor, this is the signals we get out, and then from that I learned a model, and I actually learning the circuits, I mean it wasn't just an American model, but actually learning the Boolean circuits uh, of the chip, manufacture the chip, and manage to run Linux on it. Uh, so just from a black box observation, going all the way to working the processor. It wasn't fast, it was like a 486, 300 megahertz something, but it worked. Uh, so that came out the other day. Uh, so, so I think that's an example where, I mean, you're not learning an arbitrary representation, you're actually learning a, a logic, Boolean logical representation of the circuit. And that gives you a lot of value. Uh, and then we can use these models, uh, both of course to make explanations of things that has happened in the past, and we make predictions of things that are likely to happen in the future. Uh, so, so I think this is in some sense the uh, yeah, general direction, I, think, I, I believe. Uh, next please. Yeah, so this is just a summary of the, the Taylor network. Uh, so the, the focus here is really how do we develop the scientific foundations for trustworthy there. And I, I would say that our focus is very much on the technical part, so developing new methods, algorithms, and so on, that allows uh, these applications to actually be, be built. So uh, next. So now, I mean, that concludes that part. I have, have, <laughs> have a lot of more material I can talk about. Um, so, so I have some of my more uh, consequences of these systems. Uh, I have a little bit about education, because I mean, you mentioned education. I think that's super important. So what I think I will do is just very, very quickly uh, mention a few things. Uh, so the first thing is that I think that one of the things we will see, I actually think is probably very much related to e-governance, uh, and that is that uh, now that we're starting to study the way that humans make decisions, we will realize that we're probably quite bad at making decisions, and this, this will not be popular, and it will kind of go against our expectations that we are good at making decisions. Uh, and the example I've been using here is the uh, French legal system, uh, where they made uh, basically all the court cases available digitally. Uh, of course, people start to study how do French judges make decisions. Uh, they looked at uh, asylum cases and came to the conclusion that it matters more which judge you get than the circumstances in your case. And of course, uh, the, the researchers contacted the, the, the Bar Association. Do you want to have a discussion around it? No, 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 we're not interested. Media finds out they're unhappy. And what do they do? They make it illegal to do this study. Because, of course, French judges are, um, can never make mistakes. Uh, so, therefore, we make it illegal to study how individual judges make decisions. So, if you now replicate the study, you're breaking the law. And I hope that this will not be the case in other countries, but rather we see that, oh, well, that was not the intention. Of course, we want the, the, the law to apply equally, so we need to fix it. How do we do it? So, I want to take the advantage of how do we take this as a way of making better decisions in going forward. How do we learn to make better decisions? But we'll see. Next. Uh, we talked about this uh, uh, job. I mean, I'm, the short version is I'm not worried. I'm, well, I'm not worried in the long term about the job market. I'm more worried in the short term in the sense that I think there will be big changes to what competences will be uh, required and what competences will be valued. But I think in the end, uh, I don't believe that there will be significantly fewer jobs. But I think the jobs will be different. And, and uh, in some, some sense, to, to sometimes to be a bit provocative, uh, I mean, there were all these reports 10 years ago uh, saying that 50% of all the jobs would disappear. I say that unfortunately it's not that good. Uh, it's because it's quite easy if it's like oh, all the, I don't know, railway, railway workers are displaced, then you know all oh, you have railway workers, they know these things, let's re-educate them, here are the things that they can do instead. I mean, that's relatively straightforward. Actually, we have a much harder problem, namely that basically everyone will be affected, but in different ways. So, no, probably most jobs will be affected, but no job or very few jobs will completely disappear, which is much, much harder to deal with from a policy perspective. 
And the reason is that what's being automated is not jobs, but activities, uh, tasks that you do at work. And depending on what type of job you do, there are different amounts of things that you do that could be automated, so therefore you're, you're influenced uh, differently. Next. Uh, and uh, there was also a study uh, not long ago where they actually started to look at uh, using these tools to uh, quicker get workers up to speed. And they had this interesting finding that if the workers use the tool from the beginning, they much, much, much quicker reached a higher productivity level. So uh, after four months, they were as productive as someone who has been doing the work for 10 months by using these tools. But if they introduce the tools in the middle, uh, so, so those that received uh, assistance here in the middle, they also improved, but actually not that much. So, so with the current kind of tools that exist, you have the most benefit early on uh, when you learn a new job, then you quicker can, can come up to speed. That's one, one example here. Yes, next. And of course, we have this interesting, uh, uh, old interesting uh, questions regarding what are the consequences for education now that we have uh, GPT-4, ChatGPT, and so on that are very capable of at least uh, um, uh, answering the questions on the exams correctly. Uh, so this is just a number, see how well the, the GPTs did on the number of exams, which of course are mainly American. I find it interesting that environmental science was the easiest, but apparently English language was difficult, which sounds a bit strange, but anyway. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think this is better, illust uh, more illustrative example, uh, and that's, uh, they did a study on uh, the bar exam uh, in, in the UK, I don't remember which university, but, uh, and they came to the conclusion that if you just look at the exam scores, uh, GPT-4 was better than the average student on the, the uh, 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 law program. And of course, I mean, the people on the law program, not people in general, they're I mean, probably highly selective to begin with, and still GPT-4 was better than the average person on that education when it comes to uh, the completing exams. So what are the consequences of this? Uh, I think for me, at least, the first observation is that Probably very few would hire GPT-4 as the lawyer. So apparently <laughs> there are a lot of things that these people know and can do that this system cannot do that we value. So I think one of the first observations for me is like, we are probably not uh, examining the things that we really value. I think examination is very much this, well, we sh you look for the keys where the light is, not where you drop the keys. Uh, where that? Because this is the things that's easy to test, therefore we test those things. But I don't think that's really what's being valued in the, after, after your education. So I think that's the first observation. Well, the first observation is that you probably won't hire GPT-4 as your lawyer, so I don't think this means that your lawyers will all be unemployed. And secondly, I think we are uh, measuring the wrong things. Uh, and third, uh, I think uh, in the more long term is, of course, what are the things we should teach? I mean, in some sense, what are the things that these people know that we value that this system cannot do? I think that is what we probably should focus more on. And likewise, the things that these systems are good at, we probably should put let, less emphasis on and uh, spend our time on other things. So my general uh, opinion there is that I think we, will, if you compete against the computer, you will always lose. I mean, there's no point in trying to be better at the doing mental arithmetic than a computer. I mean, it's just pointless. You will never be better at it. Uh, so it's clearly that there's no point in competing, but rather to be complementary. That's where we should put the focus on. Uh, and I think this will probably have quite a big uh, effect on education, but in a more longer term. Next, please. Uh, and actually, I think this is a good thing. I think the things we see are good. And the reason is that we are currently in a big, what to say, we have a big problem. Uh, so, so actually this slide is from the, uh, the local health, the health, um, uh, yeah, uh, health, not what you call, uh, health services uh, in Linköping. 
Uh, and basically the problem is the following that, I mean, the amount of information and amount of things that they could take into consideration when they're making medical decisions is basically growing exponentially. There are so many things that they could take into consideration when making decisions. But the kind of human uh, cognition is more or less the same. If you believe in the Flynn effect, this has a small linear increase. Um, but anyway, that, I mean, if you have an exponential increase in the amount of things that you need to consider, and you basically have a constant amount of capacity to do it, yeah, well, it will not be possible. Which means that if you, which you have by law, a medical doctor has to make the decision based on the best possible uh, information. And how do you do that when there's so much information that you cannot even deal with it? And of course, today there are two ways of dealing with that. One is specialization, which of course we see very much that you become more and more specialized. So in a small area, you're able to keep up with the latest developments. But if you take a broader perspective, you have no chance. The second is that they would build tools to help us deal with all this, which of course we see is the, the, what's happening here as well, that we are building more powerful tools, which are allowing us to actually make better decisions. Uh, so therefore, uh, this is basically, I think this is necessary that we have these kind of tools to help us. But there's a different interpretation of this, and that's from education. Because what we can interpret this is that the amount of knowledge that's being produced in the world is basically exponential. Um, and that means that assuming that our medical doctor, say that we say that the amount of knowledge doubles every two years. And we have a medical doctor that finished his or her degree and knows everything there is to know. After two years, this person will only know half. After four years, this person will know a quarter. After six years, an eighth. After eight years, a sixteenth. So we're way below 10% after eight years. Which means that we need to learn much, much, much more after we finish our education than what we do during our education. So, I mean, education with the formal education is basically a drop in the ocean compared to everything that you need to learn. I think that's one interpretation. The second interpretation, or I mean, consequence of this is that uh, our uh, formal training in school is a constant length. In Sweden, it's uh, nine years uh, kind of primary, three years secondary, and um, five years uh, tertiary university education if you want the master's. So that's fixed length. But the amount of knowledge that we want and we could fit into our education grows exponentially, which means that our formal education systems would cover less and less and less of all the knowledge there is. I don't know what this, the discussions are in, in Brazil, but in Sweden there's a lot of discussion on what are the, because of course there's a lot of things people say, oh, why don't you teach this in school? And why don't you teach this? And it's like, it's great things, but then the question is, what should we remove? And no one wants to remove anything. So then you're stuck. So I really think that our education system needs to find new ways of dealing with this. Either we just have to accept, well, we will teach you this tiny little fraction and most of the other things you will learn elsewhere. Or we will have a different approach. So I think, for example, we probably have to have a more diverse approach. I think it doesn't matter that much exactly what you know, as long as you know sufficiently much. And probably from a population point of view, that we cover everything, than from an individual, we're trying to make sure that all the individuals learn the same things. So yeah, there's a lot of consequences in this, but I actually think this is, to me, a really important uh, kind of challenge going forward. Next. Uh, yes, so how do we do, I mean, we talked about this humans and AI. Uh, I think the two other components is education and ecosystems. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we all mentioned these elements of AI. So I mean, this is a course that was developed by University of Helsinki, basically with the goal of educating 1% of the Finnish population in AI. They did that in less than a year. Then they had changed the goal to less, uh, educate 1% of the world population in AI. Uh, I actually don't know exactly. I think they have about 1 million uh, or something like that uh, that has taken the course in total now. So what's that, 1, 7,000? So, uh, 70 million to go. Oh, yeah. Anyway, 69 million to go. Um, yes. Uh, and we are also giving, so this Swedish was the second language, or third language after Finnish and English, uh, that was translated to. 
Uh, so we're also uh, giving university credits for this course. And I actually think this is a very interesting way of providing education, where the course itself is completely, and it's completely open online courses for free, anyone can do it anytime they like, but then we have like a validation step. So we validate their knowledge, basically to do a small test, uh, and then uh, they get the university credits for the course. Uh, and to date, I think we have about 5,000 people uh, that have got the university credits for this course. So we have about 1,000 students uh, every semester that get the credits. So it's the by far the largest course at the university. And I run the course with one teaching assistant working 20%. And we can deal with thousands of students. Uh, next please. And I may also say that um, we are now, I mean, you also mentioned that developing similar courses, we are doing that as well. Uh, so I think we have four or five similar courses, four in AI, so, so two from, from elements of AI, there's a continuation course to that one, and then we have developed two of our own, uh, AI uh, introduction elements of machine learning and AI natural language processing, and we also have a course in cybersecurity, uh, so, so we have five, five courses that uh, are similar structure. Uh, we have also, uh, I'm also coordinating a national program uh, called the Wallenberg AI Transformative Technologies Education Development Program. Uh, and basically we see that, uh, what we see is that when you have these kind of transformative technologies, uh, the education system gets into trouble. Uh, and the only question is really, how do we on the national level work to make sure that the education system is capable of dealing with these transformative technologies? Uh, and basically, there are a number of challenges. The, the first is that the educational foundations, basically, what is the content uh, of this area changes. I mean, if you go back 10 years and you ask, so what is AI? Everyone gave you the Russell and Norbit book, and then you were done. Uh, today, you cannot do that. Well, we still do it, but uh, uh, there are a lot of people claiming that, well, that's not the relevant part anymore. Now it's much different. So, so we see that the content of the field changes. Uh, the second is that we, of course, need to scale up the national education capacity. Uh, and I mean, it's not about just tripling the size of the engineering programs. That's not the, I mean, that would be easy. The hard part is that it actually uh, changes all the other programs. Uh, so I think the, the third one here is scaling out education to disciplines and professions beyond the technical core. Because we know how to teach computer scientists, we know how to teach more the technical part, but when it comes to how do we teach the socio-technical aspect, how do we do more the ethical aspects, the legal aspects, and so on, we don't have that knowledge, really. And the, the, uh, the, this kind of uh, uh, not enough space in the programs, of course, applies also to university education. And uh, so I've been trying to introduce programming into the teacher education for 10 years, now I've given up, so they still don't learn programming in teacher education. Uh, and then the, the fourth part is how do we actually use, I mean, take advantage of the technology, how do we do data-driven education and pedagogical transformation? So actually taking advantage of technology in both uh, more kind of learning analytics, but actually I think it's much more interesting to look at education analytics, looking at the larger scales, looking at programs, looking at universities, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we are designed this as a program, which means that we have six working groups uh, working on different aspects uh, so that we can easily uh, address things that come up. So, for example, we have had a seminar on these large language models of higher education. We are organizing a follow up on that in, on the 18th of September, I believe it was. Uh, so, we're trying to really push the national education system. Next. Uh, and one of the things is that we have started to develop the new AI curriculum. And, and I should say here, curriculum uh, to be interpreted in the broader sense. It's not like a single program, it's not a program, but rather what is this subject? So if you're familiar with ACM's computer science curriculum, that's the interpretation of curriculum. Where the basic idea here is computer science. Computer science is this huge field, uh, and then you have a program, you have to make a small selection of all the things. We're trying to make this broader perspective. Uh, we have an initial publication, but that's more basically this slide is the publication. It's, it's not that much more. Uh, so, so we are now defined it in a number of different layers. So the kind of core AI functionality. So this is the traditional 
technical parts. Uh, then we have the more socially and personally embedded, so basically the connections between humans and the technology. Uh, and then we have the more societal perspective as the third layer. So here we have all these ethical, legal, trustworthy aspects. Uh, and then we also made a separation between the more kind of digital and physical. So you basically say we have the same thing for it, completely digital, but the, the digital plus the physical. Uh, and then you can take even further perspectives like socially guided, is AI in an even broader perspective. And then, of course, we have a lot of people who are, uh, or rather, uh, looking at more history and futures of AI, so taking it in an even broader context. And then we have those that are really fundamentals there. What is knowledge? <laughs> so, we, epistemology, epistemology, methodology, third of three words, so basically the foundations of knowledge on the bottom there. So we're trying to try to paint this much broader uh, picture uh, as well. Next. And, and you mentioned computational thinking. I've been working quite a lot on computational thinking. I've been involved in uh, introducing programming in the Swedish uh, uh, primary education uh, a number of years back. Uh, and uh, I really think it's interesting. So, so I wrote a paper on the uh, AI computational thinking duality, and, and I really think this is interesting. So I actually think these two concepts are two sides of the same coin, uh, where we have uh, computational thinking is really about how can humans become better at problem solving by taking advantage of computers. So here the focus is on human problem solving using computers, while AI is the other way around. You want to make computers better at problem solving by learning how people do it. Uh, so also basically that's the uh, idea there. I think there is an old TEDx talk about that as well. Uh, next please. Uh, so the, the final part was about uh, ecosystems. And, and I really think that it's fundamental to realize that no individual, no organization will be able to do all of this on their own. So the only way to really address these things is to work together. Uh, we really need to work in these ecosystems. And that also applies to companies. I think for us academics it's kind of natural, but it, this also applies for companies. So it's actually when we work with, with companies and we, we kind of uh, want to see or if they are data-driven, the first step is that if you want to make a data-driven company, you should have a data-driven internal thing. So you have like a data flow within your company, you refine the data within your company. But if you really want to be a good, uh, you should actually export the data. And that's the second level where you can export the data from your company to other companies or organizations. And then the third level is, do you actually get the data back after it has been improved or uh, further uh, enhanced by third parties into your own organization? When you get that kind of data flow working, yes, then you're uh, common form. Anyway, uh, from I think we're starting to get a quite good ecosystem in Sweden. So we have a, a very large basic research program. So this is a, uh, what is it, 60, 600 million euros, 600 million dollars, but the same 15-year uh, program. Uh, that's basic research. Uh, we have two sister programs, this is Ed programs on education development, and BASP HS and Humanities and Society. Uh, we have work on AI competence, so really about professional education. Uh, we have AI Sweden, which was originally called AI Innovation Sweden, which is really about how do we accelerate the use of AI? Uh, we have these elements of AI, which is some, somewhere in between, and we have Taylor. Um, and of course, since I represent Linship University, actually Linship University is the host uh, of many of these. So we are the uh, host of the BUS program, the BUS Ed program, Taylor elements of AI. Uh, we're also the host of all the national uh, AI infrastructure, as we just uh, actually got one of the Euro HPC, so we're going to build one of the largest computers in the world. Uh, well, probably not in the physically, but uh, we are hosting that. Uh, and actually, the, the other week, we also got a, a, a new project funded called Trust LM. As we now we're going to coordinate the work of building a trustworthy large language model. Uh, and we're working together with uh, many stakeholders there to, to make this possible. So, so I would say that one of the things that we're really doing is that we are hosting and coordinating and running these really large uh, research projects uh, and, uh, and so beyond. Uh, we're also starting to get a pretty good ecosystem in Europe. Of course, Europe is much more fragmented. 
Uh, I want to lift up Adra, uh, which, uh, if you go to the next slide, I think you can No, I'll go back. Um, you can go back. Can I go back? Okay, there's no going back. Uh, so, so ADRA is the uh, public-private partnership uh, in Europe on AI data and robotics. Uh, so basically, the, the Commission is investing 1.3 billion euros into this partnership, uh, and the expectation is that the private side will invest at least as much. Uh, so it's really about how do we uh, build this uh, community and how do we accelerate the use uh, of AI and data and robotics in Europe. And next slide. Uh, was really the motivation. So I would say that uh, Europe is doing well when it comes to research. If you look at research in output, we're, well, I think we're still maybe not the best anymore, but at least close to it. Uh, the problem when it comes to research is that other parts of the world are accelerating faster than we are. But I mean, uh, quantitatively, we're doing good there. Uh, we are doing good when it comes to education. We have very good education, so we are a netto exporter of talent. Our problem is, of course, to keep in the talent and to recruit it back after it's been elsewhere. Um, but the really, really problematic part is the private investment. That we don't have the companies, and the companies are not investing enough uh, in this technology. Uh, so, so you can see that the investment has gone up quite significantly in the last couple of years. Uh, but still, it's like a third of the investments in China, and uh, a ninth or an eighth or something like that. Uh, of what's being invested in the US. And I think this is really the, this, I mean, I would argue this explains very much I mean, why do you see so many things coming out of the US? Is of course that they have the companies that are putting billions of dollars into this. And it's always kind of funny to talk to, say, the commission, and then say, well, if you have a company like uh, Google or something, they invest $1 billion a month in this technology. How much do you invest? Well, we have 10 million here. I mean, it's, it's an order of magnitude, and I really think this is the, the, the challenge. I assume you probably have similar challenges here, that, that uh, the investments are, I mean, there is significant investment, yes, but it's still an order of magnitude too low to really make the impact. And then the, and then the funny part is, of course, they expect this impact and they make this investment. And then they get, why don't we get the same impact? Well, because you are investing much less. Um, and, and, and I think this is, of course, a big challenge. Um, so so I, I think there is a significant threat in some sense, or I mean, a risk that, I mean, since the technology is being developed now and the companies are building a dependence on the technology, it means that basically means that they will be dependent on American technology which probably is good currently, but you know, don't know what happened in the future. I mean, the political situation is unclear, uh, so things can deteriorate if you're unlucky. And then you're dependent on technology that you no longer might, may not have access to. Uh, so I really think this is key for, for, for uh, future stability. Next. Yeah, so I already talked about this. Next. Yeah, so, so basically we have three main objectives. Uh, secure European sovereignty over data, AI data robotics, technologies, know-how, uh, establish European leadership in these areas, uh, and also achieve this high socioeconomic and environmental impact. Like, not high environmental impact in the, yeah, in the opposite sense, we want little impact. And of course, uh, reinforce a strong and global competitive position in Europe in these areas. Uh, but of course, at the same time, we like collaboration, uh, so there is always this kind of balance, but I would say that we are very much uh, open for collaboration and uh, cooperation, but we also want to make sure that we have the technology uh, within uh, the continent. Next. Uh, let's skip this. Next. Uh, so, so, yeah. so actually, just as we have this uh, joint uh, strategic research agenda, we are in the process of developing a new strategic research innovation and deployment agenda. Um, and uh, uh, here we have made a number of strategic directions, high-level directions. Uh, so we want to build uh, technology that's compliant with regulation. We want to achieve this strategic autonomy. Uh, we want to increase resilience of society. Uh, we want to deal with sustainability, green deals, zero carbon emission, and of course education. Uh, so these are the five, five uh, strategic directions of high-level. Next. 
And we will also fight when it comes more on the technological level. So of course, this kind of large scale general purpose generative ADR technology, uh, large scale ADR test beds uh, together with end users, uh, multi stakeholder development, verification, validation, integration of uh, decision making and social technical system. So integrating it into this larger social technical, collaborative autonomous systems and metrics for measuring progress. Uh, so, so we're these are kind of the directions we are currently moving. Next, oh, skip this one. Uh, next, uh, and and to conclude, um, I, I, I mean, sometimes I get worried that, that companies are doing too well. Uh, um, that I mean, this in Sweden has been very good times. The companies are uh, making a lot of money. They are basically. Uh, completely busy just delivering the products that they have sold. Uh, but the problem is, of course, that the world changes uh, and that uh, if they don't change as well, they may face the risk of uh, uh, no longer being in a good position. And the example I, I use is usually Kodak. Uh, we actually have a local company uh, close to where I live, uh, which was uh, betting on the mechanical typewriters when the computers came. Uh, you can imagine how that went. Uh, anyway, um, the, the codec is very interesting because basically when they were at their peak, uh, they, they basically invented digital photography. Uh, and still, but then they looked at what do we make money from? Uh, we make money from chemicals and paper. Uh, so that's our core business. Uh, and then, okay, let's sell the, the patents, so they sold the patents for digital photography and focused on chemicals and paper. And then digital photography came, and then iPhone came, and then they went bankrupt. And, and I think this is very interesting because the challenge for a company is, of course, that especially a successful company, is that uh, how much should you focus on the things that made you successful, and how much should you focus on things that may change uh, your uh, business in the future. And uh, actually, gave you, I, I use this story several times. And one time, I had someone in the audience said. That's not completely true. And I have a friend who was on the board. And apparently, uh, because my, my argument is that you have the people on the board, they will make decisions based on what made them successful. So of course, the people on the board are probably the ones that made successful in paper. In chemical, that's what they know. And they know all about it, they're experts, and yeah, they're very good at that. But they made the decisions on the wrong technology. They made the decisions on the previous technology, not the next technology. Uh, but this person claimed that actually it wasn't the board, it was the shareholders. The shareholders required that the board make decisions that maximize the short-term benefits. Therefore, they were forced. So well, if you want to blame the board, you want to blame the shareholders. Very different. Uh, but I really think this is, is challenging. And, uh, and one company I've seen that made uh, uh, actually tried to go against this was Ford. So Ford uh, had an extremely successful uh, automotive CEO. They kicked him out and replaced him with someone from Silicon Valley that knew nothing about cars. Just because of this, trying to get, oh, well, we think that digital is the future. Therefore, let's get the CEO with a completely different perspective. Of course, we have a lot of people that know cars, so that will disappear. And it seems like they're still doing quite well. So maybe that's a good move. But I really think it's, it's when your company or when your organization is doing its best that you have the opportunity to change. When things are going downhill, you no longer have the resources or the customers to, to make the change. So please change. Uh, to conclude, uh, I mean, I talked about a lot of things, but uh, yeah, I haven't talked about AI that much. <laughs> but uh, AI is about understanding intelligence and develop systems that exhibit intelligent behavior. Uh, I believe that AI will uh, affect all aspects of society, and thus trust is essential. Uh, to be trustworthy, uh, a system should be uh, uh, satisfied as kind of be legal, ethical, and robust. Uh, there are many initiatives, but I actually think much more is needed. There are so many uh, both exciting and uh, challenging research problems uh, in this area, and I really think this is an interdisciplinary area. It's not just technology. It's really about the technology in society, technology with humans, especially everything with has with trustworthy, explainability, interactive, and so on. So I just think this kind of interdisciplinary part will be so much more important going forward. 
And of course, Taylor is committed to develop these scientific foundations. And we believe that they will need this kind of integration of more model-free data-driven approaches with more knowledge-based, uh, uh, reasoning-based uh, approaches. And of course, in, um, it's not a question of AI or humans. It's all about AI and humans together. Thank you. Two hours. <laughs> uh, it's just, I mean, when you have been on vacation, it's like first talk in several weeks, and you have no clue how to do it. Do we have, too long. Do we have any questions? People are just too tired. No, but <laughs> the back, I think, was first. You can check this one. Right yeah, which is? Oh, okay. yes. 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 You will run and I will stand. Yeah. I will now be restricted by this cord. Limited autonomy. What autonomy? <clears throat> okay. So I have three questions, basically. Uh, the first is related to what Marisa uh, presented earlier. And basically, Marisa mentioned that education is a fundamental tool for the future generations on how to do with AI, right? And Frederick, uh, can you comment about the education on the AI in Europe and or Sweden? What do you think about uh, how you're doing there? So for, I, mean, I firstly completely agree, and uh, I actually think this is very interesting. We've been very fortunate, we actually got two new projects uh, on AI literacy. Uh, so we now have two projects looking at AI literacy. So we're working both with the kind of more content side, but also working with teacher education and so on. Uh, so I, I would say that my understanding is that there's basically little, if any, <laughs> education in this. I would say that, uh, as I said, we. We introduced programming into the Swedish curriculum in 2016, I believe that was. Uh, so, I mean, formally it's in the curriculum, but the problem has always been in the implementation side, and especially it's been the teacher competence has been lacking. Uh, and, I mean, you mentioned this, that there's just been the principles. So, basically, there's one line in the curriculum, oh, this is what you should do. Uh, but then how you actually... Uh, implement that is up to the schools and the teachers themselves and since they never really got an education yeah uh, so I really think that uh, the core problem is the lack of competence among the teachers uh, and as I mentioned that uh, I've been trying to get it introduced in the, in the teacher education but even that is hard uh, because again they say we don't have space we have so many other things we want to include so there is no space for programming sorry and therefore we don't get anyone. Uh, and I think that that's the challenge. Uh, there, there is, I would say that there, there is a lot of initiatives, but I think on the national levels, there are probably very little, at least on the primary. And uh, when it comes to secondary, I think there are a little bit more, uh, but uh, on the primary, it's very limited. Yeah, because uh, I know a few schools that they have uh, some programs for uh, programming, right? teaching programming in schools, and for example, I think in Italy we have uh, the Lusaki, I think it's a school that they have uh, computer programming, and, but I think it, maybe it's a first step before teaching like AI, right? So first yeah, programming. Actually, so so I, I would even argue that I think AI could be a way of approaching uh, programming in school, because the, the pro one so uh, if you look at programming in school, most schools start out with block-based programming, say Scratch yeah. and similar, and do that in, in um, up to middle school. Uh, and that usually kind of works. I mean, it's easy to do something. It looks nice. You get some games. You get some interactions. The, the kids kind of like it. Then they get into uh, the next level where it's supposed to do Python programming. And then that's a completely blocked. So, so uh, a number of years back, I, I ran a, a project where we were teaching teachers how to do programming. Uh, and I mean, the teachers learned how to use Scratch very well. I mean, they were doing it very well. And they came to me, oh, we want to, we want to do the next thing. We want to do Python. Okay, great. So 
I, I tried to teach them some introductory Python, and it was like extremely difficult. And I mean, I was saying, you are doing exactly the same thing, the thing you do with the loop that you do in, in Scratch, you just write the same thing in Python, and you do the same thing. I mean, it seems that cognitively it was very, very different. And it also seems that the transfer from block-based programming to text-based programming is virtually zero. So it seems like it actually gives very, very little. And, 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 and I think there's been some scientific studies towards that end. So, so doing the, the, the block-based works, doing the fun robot programming works, doing the text-based, getting started with text-based programming is really, really difficult. Uh, and there, and one reason is that it's boring. It's conceived as boring. And uh, therefore, I think machine learning and so on could be that actually you do an AI application. And then, of course, in order to do your machine learning, uh, for example, there were some, uh, say, watering plants. Then you need to regulate how much water should you have on a plant, learn how much to, to, to do that. Then you need to collect some data that requires programming to collect the data. You need to format the data. You need to put it into the learning algorithm. You get something out, and then you use that to control the system. You get a, a, a fun application, but you actually don't need that much programming because, in some sense, that's hidden in the machine learning part. So I actually think uh, machine learning and AI can be uh, uh, as, uh, an approach to make programming more fun. Yeah, so maybe we can teach both together, right? So instead yes, of just yes. like programming as a first step and then AI. But the, I think one other aspect there is that the focus is very much on the technical side. The focus is on programming, uh, algorithms, and so on. Uh, so so uh, actually, when we changed the curriculum in 2016, I, I, I tried to push that uh, the subject that should change the most is social sciences. Because there you have all these kind of, I mean, what's the consequence on uh, society? What's the consequences on elections, democracy, and uh, journalism, and all these things that are being taught in those uh, social sciences courses? Uh, because that's, uh, um, I don't know, I know what's in Sweden. It's like, oh, let's introduce AI on the technology specialization in the high school. But in my argument, why? That those are the people that need it the least. They will learn it anyway. The people that need it most are the ones that are not studying technology or engineering or these things because they might not learn it elsewhere. So I think the the, 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 the problem is that the, the mindset is that AI is a technology rather than something that influences all aspects of society uh, and the same with digitalization. And, and I think that's probably part of the core of the problem. The second core of the problem is teacher education. Yes. Uh, I have another question, Kenneth. She ran away, so I guess you still have that mic. Yeah, I have, <laughs> I have the microphone. So. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, another question. So it's basically related to education as well, but like, uh, not so much. But yeah, as technology is often seen as positive and neutral, uh, what are other ways besides education and government policies to ensure that individuals are safe from unethical applications or pro programs? So, of course, that's a broad and general question. I mean, I would say that regulation is one way, but I mean, I actually think education is a much better way. And the reason is that uh, someone said that basically education is vaccination, I guess, mis against misinformation and so on. That, I mean, of course, we can try to regulate away all the bad things. Uh, we can try to uh, yeah, make it harder to get access to, to things that you shouldn't have access to. But it's even better if you as an individual are capable of determining and for yourself deciding, should have, is this believable or not? Or is this good or bad or not? And actually, my personal perspective is that I think we are over... Uh, over, we're trying to make society too safe. I don't know about here, but in Sweden, it's like you cannot have a playground for kids. I mean, there is like, oh, it doesn't matter if you kind of throw yourself down uh, from the playground to the f f ground, you should not still, it still shouldn't hurt yourself. And it's like, and, and I think the problem is that kids never learn how to, to estimate risks and deal with risks. They, they, are, they are brought up into a perspective where everything is safe. It doesn't matter what I do, everything is safe. I, I should be able to fall down from here, so I don't need to bother to keep the balance. I don't know. And, and I really think this is problematic. I think we need to 
to learn to deal with risks, and we need to learn to deal also with these kind of risks. And, 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 and therefore, I think education is superior to regulation, but of course, regulation can support it. Yeah, I also think about culture as well. The paper, the, the yeah, how, how the culture influences how people think about technology and how they think it's very positive or neutral. And besides, like they, they also need to think about how the technology can be like unethical or can be harmful sometimes. And so, yeah. So I think the cultural connection is very interesting. I mean. There is these discussions about this kind of more, more say, technological imperialism and so on, especially if you are having West. I mean, you, you mentioned it's also, I think you mentioned that there was no, or maybe with you, that there were no people from South America in these kind of global committees and so on. And I mean, I think that's, of course, there is always a risk that you get a technology that's kind of global, but it's built on values from cultures other than your own. And actually, we are using the same argument in Europe that, well, we don't want to have, we want the systems that are based on European values. So we, of course, also want to make sure that the systems that we are using is based on our culture and other cultures should probably do the same. So yes, yeah, because sometimes we use systems that are made for, by like five white men and the entire world is using this system. So, <laughs> yeah. Said the two white men talking. <laughs> Thank you. Now we will have, I think, about some. First of all, I just want to to say that it was a very interesting presentation. So I, mean, I saw a lot of different aspects here. That are, um, you know, new for me. Uh, my question is related to the regulations part when you were talking about regulations. And as you said, I mean, you are creating a regulation for the European community, right? So based on your values, I suggest to it. But uh, how, you know, this group uses some of the, you know, knowledge or the same type of concerns that we, you know, are being handled inside the business companies, like for example, I just came from IBM. So I, I know that inside IBM we have a, a whole set of you know people, group working exactly on the same, you know, how to define the ethics parameters and how to handle you know situations of AI. And then IBM probably is one of the companies that has been working on with AI. Longest, right? So it's a company of more than 100 and something years. I think since the 1940 something, they have been working with AI. So they are really concerned with these aspects. And uh, how this, you know, when you are dealing with these regulations, because these companies in the end will be the ones that have to abide to these regulations, right? So how do you see, you know, the cooperation of these companies? For example, like IBM or Google or AWS, for example, when defining this type of regulations for data. So, I mean, yeah, there are many aspects that, I mean, one aspect is that there were people from those companies involved in this high level expert group. So, Francesca Rossi from IBM was part, uh, uh, what was his name? It was from Google, I forgot his name. Uh, there was people from Canada, from their Element AI, I think they were a company they called. Uh, so, I mean, there were people, uh, Philip Siemens, um, there were companies involved uh, in this SAP. Um, uh, they were involved in the discussions. Uh, and I mean, actually, I think at least my impression was that they weren't that much different. I think that the focus is more that. I mean, I would say that if, if you take the high level expert group, I think the difference was more what was the prototypical uh, application they had in mind. Uh, and I think the people that were working more on the technology side were thinking more about the technology and, and much broader, while the people that did not work in technology were philosophers or ethicists and, and so on and so forth. I mean, they were basically thinking about Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, Google, I mean, and it's like, but those are very particular applications. 
So, so I think it's more a mindset than where you come from, what kind of company you come from. Uh, I think there is probably a major issue when you come to these global companies and how to deal with multiple regulations. I mean, Facebook, of course, is a very interesting example where every country has different regulations and they have to try to find some kind of common ground. Uh, and uh, so, so I would say it's probably more a problem from the company perspective how to deal with multiple regulation than from say our perspective as this kind of panel expert trying to take this into consideration. So back then, I think there was, I think was, maybe it was Google that released. There was some company that released there uh, while we were working, but when we started, there were no uh, kind of principles and so on. Then afterwards, of course. Most companies have followed. So, I mean, I would say it's a give and take, it's interaction. I, it's not a one way direction. I see. And, and the other thing I wanted to comment is that, um, I mean, from my perspective, right, and uh, I also like the, the, the term that IBM used internally. Uh, we, we never said artificial intelligence, we, we were saying augmented intelligence. Because that's why exactly what I think. I mean, when we are using these, they are tools to, to you know to help the, the people. And I I understand it from an education perspective, and you know, people start using chat GPT to answer questions and things like that. I mean, we should not actually, from my perspective, be against that, but also but but use it, uh, or teach them to use the tool, just you know, to help them to do the things. I mean. Teaching them how to use the tool is more important than you know trying to you know avoid them you know using this for that or that. so it, as you said I mean maybe it's the way that we are uh, pro uh, uh, doing the examinations and things like that they are wrong right so we actually have to enforce them to or expect them to use the tool I mean, AI is there for you know that I mean. Some some people are talking to me. Oh, are you, are you going to use ChatGPT to do some research? Like, oh, of course, I mean, it's a tool. Oh, well, from my perspective, even writing the text, I mean, ChatGPT will probably do much better than a human from writing the text. And this is not, I mean, uh, I as a researcher, I don't think that we should be. Uh, consider because we are a good writer or something like that but because you have an idea or you have you know it's ex exercise the process right that's that's why i understand so i think yeah i mean i can see a lot of uh, well there's a lot of discussion around these definitions of terms and so on uh, and I, I mean i would say that when it comes from a regulation point of view uh, i think the challenge is do you regulate technology or do they regulate applications? Personally, I think we should regulate the applications, not the technology. And I do think that the way that the, 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 the uh, text is written, it, uh, it feels more like the, regulating the technology, which I think is not the, the proper way. Uh, and so I do think there are some concerns there. I think changing it to augmented intelligence will not really change that but uh, yeah I, I, I see the concern and it's been discussed and uh, I think we just have to live with the fact that it's called AI now. <laughs> yeah. um, it's one and ten. Apologies. No, no, oh. no, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, actually uh, this was supposed to be only a re uh, meeting so we turned it into Workshop, uh, so but I think we we should lunch yes for lunch now yes. and then we'll come back at maybe two thirty. That's okay. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Frederick, very much for your very good presentation. I think that there are many many things to discuss. We will discuss a lot up to tomorrow and. Um, I hope to see you all at 2.30. For the people that are following us at YouTube, uh, we are not going to transmit this part, the, the second part of the workshop, just because we are going to discuss the ongoing research and possible 
uh, partnerships and so on. Uh, but of course, you can send me an email, or I can put you in contact uh, with Frederick, or you can contact him directly, please. And thank you so much for your attention. And I hope uh, we evolve AI in a very better way. Thank you so much. Thank you.